Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Raj Marwad. Raj, you ready to be great today? I am. Raj is the CEO and founder of, how do you say it? It's, it's Thrive Health. Thrive, yeah. Thrive Health. Well, that's bad. Well, that's bad. A venture back company developing a business in a box for wireless providers to optimize the business revenue through tech and personality matches, leading to a 2.7x multiplier of client LTV. Previously, he was a founder of the Next Level Fitness, a direct to consumer health and wellness company. Raj, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. I'm excited, brother. So, so first thing, um, you're, you're a mentor in um, Founders Institute, correct? Yeah. How long have you been doing that? Oh, going on a year and a half, maybe the second year. Now. So it's been a lot of fun. I met uh, Jeremy here in Seattle and I met Levi here and uh, going on two years working with the Seattle and Austin group, because as we mentioned, I'm from Texas. I was actually lucky enough to work with the Levant group. The Levant group is actually back home because we're from the Middle East. So it's actually a charter and a chapter in Lebanon, Iran, and Iraq. And I think that's probably been the coolest thing uh, that I've been able to do with the Founders Institute, which is help people back home and see how we can help, you know, across, across, across borders, to be honest. So first, cheers. Yeah, cheers, brother. <laughs> there you go. So um, I'm going to have you walk me through some real fast, right? So I'm part of Founders Institute, too. We started, I think, last Wednesday, been with it for a week. And so we have a meeting tomorrow. So from the 15th to 22nd, we got to do customer interviews. So I was going to have you walk, walk us through, like, how would you do customer interviews? What would be your advice to, like, a new, brand-new founder, founder institute? They have an idea. How do you go about getting customers? Like, for me, I, I know my customer base, so to speak, right? What would you advise? Like, what, what type of questions? Five questions, 10 questions? Tell us anything you can think of. Absolutely. And that's a great point. Our customer discovery was, was an ordeal. And I don't know how the Founders Institute does it, but it's probably like, hey, get your 50 calls in, 10, 15, 20 calls. Um, so for us, we actually ended up doing about 97 of these discovery calls. And I thought to myself, I got to find my persona, my niche, and my beachhead market. If you're not 100% what sure that is right then and there, I wouldn't go directly into the customer discovery yet. Really start thinking of the persona of that person you're going to really help. And not with that pain pill or with that vitamin, but with a real pain pill. So, you, so you're saying if someone's out there says, my customer's everyone, they need to like go back to the drawing board, right? I hate to be that person. Yeah. Because that's messaging is hard to talk to a, a mom, a daughter, a brother, a sister, an octogenarian, a 20-year-old, a high schooler, a PhD. So if you can really, if your litmus test is everybody can use this, take a pause. Really take a pause. Or else you're just going to kind of start running in circles. So we really got to what does, and then you have to think on CJ, like whatever that persona is, what does success look like to that person? Success to you could be, hey, X amount of views, awesome. Success to me could be X amount of dollars. So it's really important to understand your persona, the problem that you're trying to fix before you interview them. What does success look like to them? Because then that's one of the biggest questions we had is kind of, we have these open-ended questions as to what does success look like to this specific person? Again, it could be a peak performance athlete, or it could be a middle manager over at Amazon. And as a PM with some features coming out, it's a very different success of this was deployed, this was deployed instead of, hey, we got X amount of points in the game. So it's really important to know what success looks like. For us, what we ended up doing is um, ours was really, ours was actually pretty simple as a direct consumer health and wellness. And we thought to ourselves, where do most people go for questions about their health and wellness and if it's a corrective exercise which we really try to focus on obviously the first thing was youtube so we started looking at some of the keywords and the key questions for health and wellness on youtube from our persona and we used about four or five of those questions in our customer discovery what i found was the best thing is i was projecting a lot of my thought process so i've been in the industry for quite some time when it comes to health and wellness and i said it's probably convenience and finances that are the biggest barriers to entry and i was sorely mistaken so what we did is after we took about 15 minutes, and I, I'd implore everybody to try this, um, Mars View. Mars View AI is like a transcription recording service. So imagine, Jason, you want to do your 15-minute calls with some of your customer discovery. It's great. We ended up recording every single one of those conversations. So we had 97 conversations. Did, and do you have to get permission from people to do that? 100%. Absolutely let everybody know that they're recording them. Um, did anyone ever say, no, don't record it? Actually, one person did. Uh, we still obviously did the interview and, and, and tried to understand, and it was nothing other than they were in a position where they just didn't want to have their name out. Um, so we recorded it. And then Marsview has that transcription. It's, it's almost like, I think it's 8,000 minutes for free. So you guys don't even have to pay for it. And what we did is we went in and we basically, through SQL and Python, we ran a word cloud. So we took all those transcriptions and just popped them up into a word cloud. And the top 
friction points were so far off my radar of understanding. And that's when we really started understanding healthy habits and health and wellness isn't about money or, or, or actual convenience. It's really about the long run. We've realized, hey, Jason, you know, there's somebody waiting on you. There's somebody empowering you. There's a community here for you, the Pelotons, the, the, the CrossFits and whatnot. So it ended up being a relationship portion. And that's kind of how Thrive was born. It's almost like the Myers-Briggs for your personal training. Okay. So do you want that drill sergeant, Doug, or do you want your empathetic Eric? And, you know, it really panned out through those customer discoveries that we had. Too. It's important to, it's tough. I had a, a my mentor, Sean, he, um, he almost did like, I almost tried to go lockstep or whatever he did. I tried to do better. So he's like, all right, 60, you know, blank customer calls. Like, cool. I got to, got to beat Sean. And that's how I knew that due diligence. We were kind of narrowing where we wanted to. And I'm guessing you'd recommend, you know, if you had to reach out, like, like for us, we got to talk to nine people. You would say, find nine people you don't know, right? Oh, Versus yeah. nine people like, you know, and even like you talk to nine people you, you don't know, human nature is like kind of be nice, you know, no how do you, how do you like, how do you like read through the niceness, you know, no and get the, real, get the real answers, you know? You don't, I'll be really upfront because they might not even know and they're giving you that bias. Um, unless you have, you know, some people that you really, you don't like the joke is my wife is a great red team because she hates everything that I do. So like, what do you think about this? She's like, <laughs> So yeah, I would, I would, uh, we even call them third network. So not even your first friend or friend of a friend. Do you know anybody who knows anybody? <laughs> so, so we do that third network effect. And that's when you get some of that raw stuff of like, so what is this experience again? Like, and then, and then you start getting to the real questions like, all right, so not just the five-year-old doesn't understand it, but the third network person doesn't understand it. Is there like a, anything out there that says, you know, you should ask like 10 questions, five questions, or is this, or is this like mix it up to the founder to say, this is what I need to learn to gain something from this. I'll be really honest. I think if you, you they'll gloss over after five, we yeah. try to keep it to three to four mm -hmm. to be really honest and have more of a dialogue. Mm -hmm. And the dialogue were just under threads of three or four. Um, and there's some pretty, pretty bespoke ones to what you want to do and where you are in the stage of the startup. But realistically, it's the, the three or four that pretty generic of, oh, what do you do now for this situation type thing? And where do you go to? And then you get more of this, the user story before overcoming up on seven and eight and nine, they're like, yeah, I, I know whenever I get a survey, it, it's, it, when I get to question 10, I stop. Like, that's my cutoff. I don't care who it is. And that's like a really good friend that yeah. asked me to do it, you know, but that's some random survey. I, I, I'll do nine questions, right? 10, I'm done. Like, I'll, I'll email, them, hey, I can't, I can't deal with this. This is too much. And then you almost have to preemptively mentally prepare them. Hey, can you answer this quick nine questions? You know, so yeah. then you're mentally like, all right, on this ninth one, I'm done. I can yeah. get to nine. But if it's like, all right, here's some question here on number nine. Like, well, if this is going to go to 27, I'm I yeah, I okay, to yeah. Send, but and plus two, like, you know, would you rather answer nine questions like this? You no, know, pick A, B, C, and D, or five questions, but you have to do like a paragraph yeah. typing, a paragraph, or which one, right? Exactly. If you get a little bit more detail and hear their voice, their mm -hmm. story, it's a little bit more, it's a higher efficacy. And that's why I just like talking and then having the transcription do it. So I'll use myself as an example, right? I'm doing the interviews. And so my company, Kevin is HR, we're going to do HR for companies for you on a few people. So should I reach out to only small business owners with 49 or fewer people or anyone who works in a company of 49 people? Interesting. HR specific to what? Uh, in, employee handbooks, uh, HR policies, job descriptions, onboarding, sponsor advice. That's interesting. So what I would do is, I, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm right there with you. You have your target market sizing. I think also then what I would do is, and what we did is we looked at some antiquated industries where we know these things aren't in place. Mm -hmm. And somehow there's a high churn, a high turnover because the internal processes weren't good. Um, I think you couldn't quickly start getting a little bit more detailed in your beach and niche head market of exactly what you're trying to solve and those pain points. Because, you know, a 49 person company or under 50 might have a great infrastructure already. And then so until you start seeing, okay, well, this is more of a, hey, it's 50 people in this company, but 40 of them are 1099, mm -hmm. so kind of like independents there's no seamless transition at that point. So they probably need you know, a little bit more internal uh, processes. So I get a little, I'd even start learning more about the industries and how they operate um, before even start getting that list down. And you need to get how many all in? About nine or 10? Yeah, we got to do nine, nine in one a week, yeah. What were some of the examples that you were thinking of? Uh, just like, you know, I have a pretty good network, you know. So what I did already, you know, I sent a message on Twitter, you know, hey, this is going on, you know, who's my candidate leak? The same thing with um, LinkedIn. Yep. Plus, I'm reach out to people in the podcast, you know, and, and ask them not to interview them specifically, but can they refer someone else, you know? Totally. Yeah, so we're going like that. So that worked out. And so how we did it, then what we found was um, there was like a group, a Slack group, and this is Slack group is a Seattle specific, um, the FANG computer engineer. So it was your Facebook, Apple's, you know, Netflix's and the Google's. 
And I kind of just threw a grenade in there and I said, whose lower back hurts by the end of the day? Mm -hmm. And you can imagine my, my end user is a person who's kind of hunched yeah. over all day long. And it was a 230,000 person Slack group. And so we had almost, you know, 1200 people be like, yeah, I have some questions and here's how I do this, this, and this. So we were lucky enough to find a really good watering hole before we started uh, trying to talk to people. So we found them all in one real good spot. Is there a difference in doing interviews like, you know, over the phone, in person, Zoom? Do you find like they're better in person or, or, or what do you think? A hundred percent. And this is just me as a, uh, philosophically, when, when everything happened in our, in our brick and mortar direct consumer wellness, we didn't go virtual. I, I truly feel there's a dynamic that's missed in this interpersonal connection. We might go from macro communities to micro, so a little bit smaller pockets. I don't think we're going to go completely virtual. So if you can, even if it's just not a call, but you can see their mannerisms, their face, the emotions, the oh the lean in mm -hmm. factor that's a delta because then that's when you know you hit that problem point like yeah hey jay if you could solve this for me instead of this hey if you could solve this for me so you yeah. can kind of get their mannerisms and you know again that's a that's a testament to everything on the virtual world uh, you know everything going with peloton and stuff like that i, I don't think people are gonna re be replaced by virtual yeah yeah I, i'm a big fan of remote but like there's nothing i can first like like you was actually in podcast like a, a month ago but you know something you got sick i think yep and so you should be going to virtual now man let's do it in person yeah. in person just just so much better right it's, it is man and i got to see the tattoo yeah we got to you know we got to drive yeah. live on that and then we then we connect yep and then, then the relationship and then the, the dialogue completely changed instead of just like yeah like i learned from texas i learned from fair texas we both know ricardo perez that's crazy man it's like, <laughs> like, i saw that I have the same tattoo and stuff like that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's crazy. So let's suppose like, like suppose I do my nine interviews. Anyone who this Institute of Seattle's nine interviews. What information should they track? Should they track like the who they talk to, the answers? Because one thing I messed up on a couple years, I did I did this a couple years ago, right? I talked to a lot of people. What I messed up on, I really, I did, I, all I did was I just tracked like, um, it was more detailed in this, but I, but I tracked basically like, where they pay for Kevin's HR is affordable and you know, all this kind of stuff. I didn't track, you know, what the problems were. I didn't track who they were, the emails. I, I just like, I just like 80% said yes. And I would that, right? Yeah. So how in depth, I'm guessing it has, needs to be pretty in depth in detail, but what metrics should we all be tracking to use this? Cause I would love, I kick myself every day, man, if, if I only go back to those people again, right. But I have no idea who I talk to. Oof. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, yeah, at least a contact person themselves, but more importantly, I think what it was for us was the metrics that matter. So for again, if we have, you know, your weekly metrics that you want to, I mean, I'm not sure how the founder Institute is doing now, but if it's, Hey, these are your weekly metrics that you got to follow up on those metrics that matter need to be consistent throughout the entire time. So over the 10 weeks, it takes you to get those nine or 10 interviews. They should be the same KPIs and the same metrics that you're going to follow. So What's the size of the company? What industry are they in? What's their major point? And then if there was a pricing and whatnot, so all the questions you asked, but then a little bit more, um, you know, background and artillery on actually the, the independent party that they work with, because then you can find the friction points in the industries. And what I found really, really interesting, especially in startups is the pivot factor comes a lot because it's interdisciplinary in, in industry. Jason, business is business to me. It really, really is. I built a, a, a marketplace SaaS solution for health and wellness, but I could iterate and put that exact same thing on the prop tech side or fintech side. So once you have something that works, cross industry agnostic problems usually arise all the time. I can imagine that HR is a personnel problem and that can, they can hit any business from hospitals to, to, you know, to Google's to anything like that. So you have a really robust problem that can be pretty similar to a lot of different industries. So keeping up with that specific specificity would really help. So Arch, any more advice on, on this before we move on? Oh man, those customer discoveries, I'd be honest, really lean into them. They're important. They're really important. I don't think people enough put enough um, waiting on the customer discovery because then you'd find your real persona. You find the real person who's going to open up their wallet. And you like, see, so you might have, a, they might have a problem you haven't thought about, right? Exactly. And you got to do a quick pivot. Exactly. And actually most people finalize when they have these customer discovery questions like, wow, the same problem that I was thinking about, that's how we were, is totally different from what they're saying. So I think it's really important to get as many as you can under your belt and listen, really, really listen. Don't project what you think. Hey, so on the LinkedIn Live, um, someone named Julianne Cage said, yes, great to catch you live. And I know this one, Marcus, he's my frat brother. He's on this. We got two people on there. But just, it says eight people watch it. So time, sometimes people, of course, are in here. No worries. What frat were you in? Uh, five Beta Sigma. Um. So I yeah, yeah, because okay. you're you're I'm burning the fuck up just watching the biggest footer on. So next, um, 
let's talk about the current startup scene. What's going, what's going on, right? So go back in the day, Enron, you know, cricket company, the signs are out there, you know, Ross Fargo, like five, six years ago, they were making like fake accounts, you know, recently they did like, made all this like some kind of diversity stuff they got kind of doing. So it's like companies are doing bad things consistently doing right. And so we're talking now like all these companies like laying people off, you know, Coinbase is like, you know, now to give Coinbase some credit, suppose they're giving people like too much pay if they didn't bring them on, which is a good thing. But Coinbase, people not gonna remember this, like remember the Super Bowl ad they had? I remember. So it was like the, it was like the QR code going, going across the screen. Oh, and I heard they crushed it with that one. Yes. I heard they crushed because everyone was like, all right, fuck it, let's drive. Like they didn't know. Sorry. They did it. Yeah, you could cuss. Okay. They did it. But after that, the CEO said they did it on their own. They could, they could not find an agency to help them out. This ad agency from New York City, the female CEO came on the line and said, no, motherfucker, this is all the stuff we did for you, right? So you lied about it, right? And now this, this is like, and then you have like, you Why? know. Why? Like, what the? F and then you have like the former work CEO, um, I can't remember his name. Adam. Adam something. So he was at an interview the, 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 like a month ago. He's raising money for another for another startup and they're giving him money, right? And then. He, raised, he raised 600 goddamn million dollars. He's brother. out there. They're giving, giving more money for something else. And then you have um, Zenefix, you know, their CEO, Parker Conrad. Miss that one. What'd he do? Um, Probably another thing. He like did some legal stuff. He like he basically was selling insurance without brokers licenses, you know, and supposedly it's like, it's like a bro culture, you know, taking shots every day. Supposedly had a rule, you know, and you, everyone can, you know, Google this yourself. The Zenefix went on the Zenefix. You know, supposedly had a policy, no six in the stairways, you know, this crazy stuff, right? Yeah. So he got kicked out of Zenefix. He went and started another HR company called Rippling, and he raised like just about the same. I'm sure. And then that uh, remember that dude from um, can't remember his name, he fired like 200 people on Zoom. Yeah. He did that. The board kicked him off. Suppose the board brought him back on. Yeah. Like there's all these backed actors out there. Like they're like, do you have any morals, integrity? Like it's and it's like these same people keep getting get funded and stuff. So it's like kind of frustrating, right? It's like it's super frustrating. I think what's I think just in general, I, I've had a real and this is actually a personal issue that I deal with in in our own home. You know, I, I started in, in the corporate side. I started in a, in a bank and, and it's just really hard, man, because how are you going to, and I think that's when I started my fund. I, I ran a hedge fund for a bit, but I, I, I traded, I, I worked more on the debt side. I have another drink if that's okay. Yeah. You, try one of these other ones. Oh, I'm going to, oh man, I'm going to try uh, Kentucky straight. Um, so what we did is we, you know, I don't understand how you're going to raise how are you going to come out and say your earnings are amazing and, and bullshit as, as the CEO of a company in the very next week fire, you know, 18% of your workforce. I think what's really hard is innately people lie. And when they get in this space where they're like, you know, Theron, Elizabeth Holmes was a good friend of mine, uh, was growing up in Houston. And, and when we went over there and, and she was a good friend and, you know, you get caught up in your own words, you know, when you're the youngest self-made billionaire female, and you have a big chip on your shoulder and you're going to Barack Obama in the White House to have dinners and you want to do the right thing. You, that's a that's slippery slope, but I just, and that's why I never really got into equity. People would always tell me when I ran my hedge fund, like, oh, what do you think about Apple? I'm like, I don't give a shit about Apple because the CEO of any company can lie. Mm -hmm. And the very next week they, they, they lay off half of their people. And that's why I care very little about startups raising money. Very, very little. We can all raise money with a good story. Um, and we've seen it ad nauseum. It doesn't mean it's a viable company. Yeah, even if that's out there, even if you raise money, VC money, you still only have one percent chance of making it, right? I still don't even understand how some of these guys are valued at. Like a friend of mine works in a logistics company, valued at nine billion dollars. That isn't profitable. Explain that to me. I, I can't even in my brain. I can't rationalize that. So. I think there's some bad actors that out there and, and they put a stigma on everybody, but there's some good ones out there oh, yeah, definitely, just, yeah. and they just never get the limelight because they don't have the unicorn status. And I think, I think I might be wrong, but on your LinkedIn profile, it has a picture of a unicorn thrown up, isn't it? That's you, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's perfect. It's ridiculous. Man. And with Coinbase, like you have to question their business, right? Cause how do you not know this was going to happen? Right? Like you, you didn't have the foresight. You have, you have, you have the secret executive people on your team. And you can f foresee this. And then there was an article yesterday where supposedly like a bunch of uh, employees at Coinbase signed a petition asking the CEO to fire his staff, right? Because like the staff got in this point, right? It, we, it was like, you know, basically our prior brand is shot. If we go somewhere else, we have Coinbase, we look like shit, you know. Of course, he blew them off. Basically told them, uh, if you don't like it, go find a job somewhere yeah. else, right? You know, so. Yeah. I mean, there's another guy. I don't know if you guys saw what the Do, Do Kwan guy, um, he did the UST Terra crypto and 40 billion erased. And the amount, the amount of bullshit he was espousing 
it's it's impressive, but he could baffle everybody with the bullshit. I mean, he's he's tethering lending on cryptos versus non-collateralized assets that are digitized, and and everyone's just they're just eating it up. He's he but he raised four hundred million dollars. Guy got a tattoo of a Luna coin on his arm. I'm like, you don't even know what the fuck's going on, guys. And in three days, he lost forty billion dollars. So I, I think, unfortunately, just with the hype, it's just going to come. And that's why you know, um, our company, Art Sass, now it's there's no there's no buzzwords, there's no blockchain, mm-hmm. there's no AI, there's no ML. We found a problem and we fixed a problem. Like find a need, fill a need. That's what business is to me. I don't need any bullshit just to pretend like. I mean. I know who, how how silly I am in general. <laughs> like I don't need I don't, I don't need pretend like I'm not. So I uh, we we steer clear of all. And I I don't think a lot of people are like I traded these derivatives and FX for 12 years. I I know these markets better than most. I still can't wrap my brain around anything that guy was saying. Mm-hmm. And you know when some people when when people rebuttal him and he goes you know I, one of his tweets was um, South Korean kid he goes I don't I don't I don't like I don't argue with poor people and I'm like it's just brilliant. You're like in a nutshell that's the entire company right there. So. At that point, you like gracefully bow out from all of it, and and don't don't hang your hat on that bullshit. It's not that's not a startup. That's just a that's that's hope. It's a lot of hope. So, Rod, you're also a board advisor for a company out of New Zealand, right? Mm. Can you talk about that? UARD, um, amazing, amazing guy. So, Doctor Hansen is is a brilliant human being, and he's doing something that should have been done a long, long, long time ago, and he's basically solidifying and then amplifying the credentials that go through real life. So for example, Jay, you were in the army for what, 25 years? 25 years, yeah. You probably had some massive leadership experience. Yes, yes. And what he's done, he's now getting you credit for that. Okay. So he's doing leadership. So you could get a master's in leadership, a master's in giving you the true accreditation from your experience in life. And to me, that's massively important because we can talk about pieces of paper and learning, but if you're in the real world experience, it's very, very different. Go back to Mike Tyson. Everybody's really good at shadow boxing, but when someone throws a punch yeah. in your face, it's totally different. Yeah. You and I can do recons all day long or, you know, any whatever physical revolution you want. But until you're out there and you hear it and you see it, it's just a lot of that. Yeah. You can do 707 flag football drills all That's day long. It. That's it. Until you get in the mouth, you're like, shit. That one hurt. Yeah. Until you get smashed in the mouth. Yeah. And then you got to get back up. And so what um, Dr. Hans is doing is he's basically, he, he went, which actually you're going to love it. Uh, Mays School of Business, AM. Okay. So he's now getting, so your experience of X, Y, and Z years, COVID, you're, you're a nurse and you just went through the worst time there is. He or she doesn't even matter, but you've seen leadership, you've seen emergency planning and management. So you get a master's in emergency prep and management through his school, which to me, and that's accredited through Texas A&M, you know, May School of Business. You are giving people with real world experience, the academic credentials that they deserve. And that's something I can really support, especially seeing the first responders that have been going through everything right now. Um, brother, sister, mom, dad are all physicians, seeing them work their fingers to the bone and understand coordinating anything under the sun in the ERs. That's leadership to me. That's emergency preparedness and management. And my, my business partner, Mary Kay, she, she has a, she's a master's, in, you know, she's in communications, internal, external management and emergency communications. It's extremely lucrative and takes a skill set that nobody understands. You know, she'll sit in front of 104 CEOs of hospitals. Great, you're the CEO of a hospital. If you can't explain to your constituency, not even even externally, but just internally as well, what's going on, people aren't going to follow you. So uh, I'm really, really happy about what he's doing. He's putting some great people through some education and getting them the accreditation that they deserve because they've gone through it. So did, did, he, did they reach out to you to be on the board of advisors? You reach out to them? And and some a few more questions, like why do you say yes to them? And what makes you say yes to anyone to be on the board of advisors? Absolutely. So I've had, had quite a few in um, Dr. Hanson. Uh, Craig is, is, he was the Delta. He is so passionate, so articulate, and shows the most leadership of anybody I've ever seen. But more importantly, he's innovative. If there's something that might, you know, he's not, um, he doesn't come, and by innovative, I mean, he, he has very little ego in a good way. He doesn't come in and see every nail with a hammer that he holds in his hand. He said, nope. This makes sense for this person. This makes sense for this person. So I'd have to be, to be honest, you know, the Delta for a lot of people too, is the founder themselves. And um, Dr. Hansen was one of those. I was like, wow, when he, when he talks, I listen. And I love what he's doing for the constituent. And how long you been with them? Oh, less than a year. Less than a year. Yeah. So next um, you have your own podcast, right? I've tried. Yeah. So what's going on with that? So you have a co-host, right? I do, my business partner. And, and is it like you like this, y'all two just talk about different things? You have any yeah. guests on, or how does that format we, work? We we almost do case case work, uh, case by case stuff. So she's a, a 
an amazing, amazing, brilliant consultant, but she, she's very complimentary to me. Um, we do, we call it almost like the goofus and gallant. Yeah. I'm goofus and she's gallant and, and she keeps everything kind of lined up and I kind of go off the rails, but she's, you know, a, a very well-educated Caucasian woman. And I'm kind of a truncated Brown kid from Texas. So our, our rapport works really well. She's absolutely brilliant. And we have a really, really witty banter, but we try and do win or learn. Um, we've both gotten kicked a lot and we all have in life and you can sit on that X of a loss or it's a learning situation. And so when I've had some stuff with, with big black marks in my career, she was there for me, helping me understand, hey, do it this way moving forward. That's not who you are as a person. So we learned a lot. It's been a lot of fun. We try and look at case studies more importantly. So internally at companies, actually perfect example. Why isn't this, what's the internal metrics and where's your employee handbook? And where's all this for your internal stuff for the HR? And why is it not working? It might not be HR. It might be, hey, you have the wrong beachhead market. You have the wrong product. Your go-to-market strategy off but we really try and find the learning side of anything that's not exactly what you thought it would be so it's been a lot of fun so from your time time being entrepreneurship you know being a lot of startups you know your experience what's the one thing you see like startup founders just consistently get wrong over and over and over again their own bullshit um i have seen so they believe they, they believe their own hype I've, I've seen it a lot. I've seen it a lot. I can't pretend I wasn't there too. Um, I was lucky enough when I, I got humbled very quickly at a very early age and it allowed me to just shut up and listen for a bit. Um, it was a double-edged sword. I did extremely well way too soon. So I started believing my own Icarus bullshit. And um, then, you know, you, you take a few shots and you come back and then you start seeing those pattern recognition. Like, oh, you have a little bit of gumption, a, lot of, a little bit of traction, a little bit of validation. And you throw your own gas on that fire. And realistically, then you get yourself in trouble. Or then you're not, you don't have the infrastructure to scale and whatnot. So I think more importantly, and this comes full circle, exactly what you said about Coinbase and raising money. Stop raising, I mean, I raise money to scale. Do not raise money to prove your product. I've known a lot of people who literally raise just to get $1 past their burn for the month. No, 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 no. If, if you're, if you're like right now, if you, if you're, waiting on market liquidity to get you off the ground your business needs a, a you need to check it yeah i've heard i've heard if you raise the money to, to pay your, your current operation costs you're, you're like doing the wrong thing it's not gonna work it's just not gonna work especially when capital drives up and your story changes and you have some some pickups so um my first startup here in seattle next level it um first month was profitable uh, and I didn't start it until it was like, I know for a fact, I do. I love the lean startup, the Eric Reese models. Um, and, and our SaaS solution first month live was 11 K and MRR completely, you know, 98% margin. So we made a point to only turn it on. It took me 17 months to get there. Let me be very, very clear about that. From ideation to first dollar of revenue, 17 months, first month, 11 K and MRR, all net cash flow. So it took time, but I like taking, and I always do this, my hedge fund, um, it was a weird six month ramp up because I don't take the buckshot approach. I take a sniper shot approach. I want to clip the wings off of a mosquito a mile away because I want to go straight, you know, institutional from the beginning. So we're very, very targeted in our approach. And that was something that was, that's been beneficial for us, especially since, you know, it's not a lot of cost spending out there, just trying to test everything out. So taking a really, really cognitive and tactile approach to the startup allowed us to be like that. And I think most founders are like, get some traction, get their name out there. And then all of a sudden they start believing their own hype. So talk about this. Like, so, so I used to be a part of Bunko Labs and the program called Veterans Residence where like rework is like 10 veterans in different cities, free space. It's like six month program. I would have to run it like weekly meetings, whatever, kind of like founding institute but with all the equity stuff. And so the beginning of each six months, I would ask everyone, would ask everyone, what, what, what do you see yourself in the end of six months? And so many people would say, you know, we would have hundred customers and raise $2 million. I always have like the drawing back, right? Let's, let's rethink this, like be more realistic, right? Yep. So many people, oh, you know, I'm, I'll be Steve Dodd, Mark Zuckerberg. And they don't realize like Apple wasn't Apple like eight years, right? Yeah. Mark Zuckerberg coded his basement, like what, how many long ago it was, right? Yeah. It's like so many people like, I have this great idea. Five people told me it's great. I see those money out there, easy peasy, right? But then they get kicked, kicked in the teeth all, all over again, right? I, and I'll just be really, I have some right now. I have a, I have a startup and um, just helping them talk and they're going straight into talking about raising money. And I said, what? 
for what? Well, the product, what product, who wants the product? Where are you going to sell the product? What's the pricing on the product? I mean, anything and everything, there was never an answer. Like, great. So you can go raise this money, which they probably could. I'll just be really honest. It's not the biggest amount of money. It's a good story, but there's nothing past the idea and the story. So at what point am I like, great, if you raise even a dollar, Jason, you still owe these people a dollar mm -hmm. and you don't really know what you're going to do with it next. And maybe this dollar that you raised, you didn't realize is actually needing to be a hundred million dollars yeah. and it's just going to end up being something tough. So, and at that point, I almost don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I almost have to be like, Hey, listen, you need to go back to your group and, and, and really tell your group what you're doing. Cause this is kind of helping as an, uh, almost like a pseudo advisory role, but they're in a, a cohort, like you, like you might've mentioned. And I, I think it's, to be honest, it's, it's, it's on that incubator accelerator cohort to be like hey listen no hold on and i was lucky i was lucky again he i even saw him walking here which i thought was crazy sean my mentor he he put me through his program and he said there's three outcomes get your product up scale your product put two in the head mm -hmm. like take it to pasture it's like no because they will tell you we need to take this to pasture you tried we've spent six weeks on this you either need to pivot or take it to pasture so I really respected that. And that's why I went through that program. Cause I was like, Hey, if you're going to tell me that my baby's ugly, I, I want to hear it. Yeah. yeah. Sooner than later. Absolutely. And then not even just your baby's ugly. You, your baby might need different shoes. Okay, yeah. cool. Let, let, let's look at someone else. So it was a really, really safe space to be vulnerable. And it was, a, and then you respect that, that person. When you have that vulnerability and you know, it's a safe space and it comes from safety and, 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 and empathy. They're not trying to shit on. You. Yeah. They're just not. Some, most up. people come from a good place, but there are a few who don't, unfortunately, you know, there are. and I, you know, most of the guys who've done it before, they know, they know how hard it was. So there's, you know, Seattle, I don't know if you know, Dave Parker, and yeah. whoo, Dan, Dave, all these guys. Oh, the one is John Seacrest. Man, John, he, uh, he don't fuck around. He doesn't fuck around. He tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. It's funny. And I, I tell people when they deal with John, when they go sit on your car, I tell them, hey, you know, you better have a thick skin. You better, you know, because he's going to tell the truth from his point of view. So Jay, my, my cap table is completely clean, except for one person, well, two, my two advisors. And this guy I keep talking about, because the first time I met him, I didn't like him. <laughs> I just, he, I was like, this guy's a dickhead. And we kept, I kept respecting him. I kept talking to him. He kept telling me that, you know, not what I wanted to hear, but what I needed to hear. He did it in the right way. And he's, and he is a, a life. I owe him. I really owe him. Like the John Seacrest type people. Yeah. So it's good to have those in your corner. Here's one for you. So people, you know, people tell you all the time, you know, take the feedback. If they say it's ugly, don't take it personal. But how do you not take it personal, Fuck right? You. You, you, <laughs> Fuck like, you. Like, Fuck like you. you invested all your time in it. Fuck it's basically face. your baby. Like, are you kidding me, right? Fuck like your face, yeah. Yeah, like, I'm not, not uh, how do you not take it first? Like, you know, you, like they're slammed and like, no, do this, do that. That's wrong, that's wrong. You're like, I just, yeah, I, I don't had, think it's realistic. I had somebody tell me, um, but let's, let's actually, let's play this game. I talk a lot. I'll just be really honest. I talk a little too much. So when I'm talking about my, my ideas and my company or whatnot, it turns into this, kind of like this verbal diarrhea. <laughs> it's like, well, and I, and I tell you 14 steps. So we have a, we have a digital health and wellness based on healthy habits on personality. So Myers big, but if I told you in seven years, we're going to be a health insurance company, you're like, what the fuck? Okay. And that's, I play chess in my head. So I had this conversation with some people and, 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 you know, I grew my hedge fund almost 2 billion. So I've, I've done some stuff. Um, and I remember I was trying to explain, I make all these assumptions. I just, I just gave all of this, oh, this is what we're doing. Blah, 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 blah. And they're like, what the fuck is this crackhead talking about? <laughs> and then this person said, you are just not a leader. And I was like, it, it just stopped me. It stopped me in my tracks. And the first thing I was like, who the, and, and so when I, when I first, when I did that, I had to stop. Mm. I just, it's like, okay, Raj, my message was terrible. My message was garbage. My delivery was garbage. It was frenetic. It was disjointed. It was, it was my brain just dump. And I'm like, so if a leader is someone who can articulately explain the vision, shit, I wasn't a leader that day. So it was hard. It was really, really hard, but um, I took it personally. Yeah. It's hard not to. I took it personally for and, 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the, I've been in a lot of pitch competitions you see all different places, you know, and like, you know, you have the people do the pitches. Things always drive me crazy. Like they'll, they'll say, the pitch is three minutes, certain number of slides. And then, you know, you do the pitch, you get the feedback from the, you know, the guest panel. You should have said this, you should have said that. Like, did you do not understand the rules like I did? Like, yeah. or, you know, of course, everyone gets good feedback. There's like only one person, right? Who plays jump to jump, to jump right? Yep. And you just tell the doctor from a good place. And but then you get to say, thank you so much. I have another, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. 
probably counterintuitive. It, that's why sometimes I don't do that. A lot of people they call it mentor whiplash. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'm like, fuck you. It's just too much noise. It's too much noise. If you can find the signal noise, great. But I, I, I totally agree with you on that one. A lot of times, especially 60 seconds, come on. Yeah. You know what's interesting though? So this is so bad. And, and John Seacrest, I was like, fuck you, John, because he kept 60 seconds cutting you off. I was like, I'm, and, and, and so then I got my ego and I got my butt hurt. And I said, no, but I, you know, I'm a, I have masters in this. I want to, let me tell, let me explain to you what I'm building. And he was like, yeah, I don't want to hear it. I was like, but, uh, and then the, another young lady was Caitlin, Caitlin brain space, amazing human being doing so good. Her and her husband, um, she, she put me in the best, like in the best way possible in my place. And I, and it was a conversation with John and everybody there. And I was like, man, this mad lib 60 second bullshit. And she goes, yeah, Raj, but what about that in the power that, that comes from the ability to actually do that? I was like, if I can succinctly in 60 seconds, give this beautiful, eloquent, big picture, whatever I'm doing, that is powerful. Yeah, that's... It, I hate to, no, I know. And so I sit back, I'm like, damn it, Caitlin, you're right. If I could succinctly be like, like, oh, like okay. ball moment right there. You know what I'm trying to say? And I was like, damn it. So then I, instead, so there was back to this. Mm-hmm. No, man, I don't need, I want, but she's a hundred percent right. The power of delivering something in 60 seconds to really get people to be like, oh shit. Yeah, I get it. It was cool. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. I, I, I personally, and I always, I wholeheartedly contend like my resume is not a piece of paper. It's a conversation. Mm-hmm. This is what I did. This is what I'm doing. This is my vision, blah, blah, blah. And not everyone wants to hear that. You're not going to get first meetings that way. Um, so I know that my, my arc is a much longer arc. Mm-hmm. And I play that long game myself. That's my personality. You have to also know who you are as a person. Yes. I mean, who you are as physically, personality, philosophy. Can you deal with the long arc, the long game? Um, with a company now, with Sarah, the, the, the founder, Barrett. I mean, I, I didn't think I was going anywhere else outside of Thrive. And he, he gets it. He gets the long game. And that's hard. It's painful. It's hard. But the long game for me is, is sustainability and real change. So Yeah, I definitely, you got to be authentic, right? I tell people for a job all the time, like, don't get me wrong. If you need a job, do what you got to do, right? You know, you know, I'm not saying lie or anything, but maybe, you know, like you, if you were for a job interview, I would say, hey, show your tattoos, right? Yeah. Be your person, right? But now if you needed like a job to, to, tomorrow because you're about to be homeless, then you maybe want to hide them, you know, or like be, you know, to ask a question, yeah, you answer it, right? But I always try to know, be authentic. Like my resume, I have my picture on it, you know, I say, you know, I'm a tattooed INFJ, army officer, you know, all this shit's out front, right? Yep. Because because like, you know, you want people to know, right? Absolutely. And my thing, people say, well, well you open up such a bias. Okay. So you're saying you're not going to look at my LinkedIn profile? Yeah. And I'd rather have like not get a call back and then go to an interview and they say, oh, you're, you're from Texas. And, and then in the back of my mind, we're not hiring you from, we're going to hire you from Texas, right? You waste all the time, right? This, to me, just be upfront about it, right? And that's why, to be really honest, it's actually a great tool because then it's binary. Yep. You know what? I have to waste your fucking time. Yep. If you're going to look at my tattoos and not look at my master's degrees, cool. I don't want to talk. Like, we're, we probably won't yeah. have a great relationship. Yeah. To me, I, I, it's fucked up, but I, you know, I left and I got knuckle tattoos for a reason. And then there's another thing with Barrett and, and, and he, all right, one of our executives has tattoos and say something. It, it's just, and, and that's, that's binary to me. That's a binary yeah. outcome of like, this is somebody I want to work with. This mm-hmm. is someone I build with because I know it's past here. It's not yeah. just a short-sighted bullshit. So my thing is like hire the best person for the job. Yeah. Really is right. You look yeah. past all the stuff, you know, you know, if you want to bring morality in, okay, maybe you do, maybe you don't, you know, but still like, you know, like, yeah, it's who's the best person for the job. Totally. And I, I think so many companies mess up and I'll, I'll use like, a, will use Uber and Chick-fil-A for example, right? Uber, like, you know, it's pretty sort of like a progressive left leading company, you know, right? So, but suppose they need a, a head of marketing. If I'm conservative, am I going to go apply to work for Uber? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. And same thing with Chick-fil-A, yeah. pretty conservative, you know, kind of Christian. Yeah. If I'm a, you know, left leaning liberal, am I going to apply to work there? I might be the best person in the job by far. I'm not wasting my time. Yeah. You know, I just think so many people are like, and of course, the business decisions, you know, you want to, you know, so it's, I think it's kind of complicated, right? I think that's such an interesting point. And you made it such a great case study. And I, I don't talk politics and religion too much, but I've, I've, I've always been very intrigued with Chick-fil-A. I really have. I mean, I know a lot of people who hate them because of views and different things, you know, but man, like they're closed every Sunday, but they perform. I mean, they, it's like, it's, Top notch. I mean, you can't deny it. Like, I know a lot of people in the, you know, the, the LBGQ community, like, like, don't tell anyone, but I'll, I'll go Chick fil A every day, right? You know, like, I'm not supposed to say this, you know, but, you know, 
it's they do something right it's crazy and uh, a good friend of mine and, and a colleague uh dave pentagrass a brilliant human being great company that he does and, and majority and he's a he's a religious person and i don't care because i think he's an amazing human but um i've seen he works a lot with chick-fil-a and i've seen a lot of his his work and his his, his employees he's on the recruiting side you see the sheer enjoyment empowerment from white black yellow orange male female chick-fil-a employees it's amazing you, you can't fake that happen you 24 cannot, 7. brother you cannot fake that 24 7. you can't and the, these people are like i love my job I, i've seen them outside in the rain come on being like hey how can we serve come you it's a pleasure thank you smiling just so happy like are you, are you sure you're okay? No, this is great. You know, what do you I go need? In, and the managers are in there doing the the, 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 the kitchen grill. And That's stuff. the biggest thing. The managers can put in work. Come on, man. Yeah, like, to me, like, I'll, I'll support that. I, I, I can't always agree with what they do. Mm -hmm. I, I respect that. Um, and Texas, to me, if, you know, some shit in Texas, I don't get either. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm bleeding Texas. I still don't get it. You don't tell my old lady what to do with her body. Just yeah. don't. That's just my, my personal opinion. But, um, you know, they built something. They, they built people that love what they, they do. And for me, that's a company. That's cool. And then I might make me making this up, but I think if you want to get a franchise, it only costs like $10,000. It's insane. And, and they loan it to you like a 1% like a interest rate. It's the stupidest shit I've ever heard. You do like Subway, it's like 2 million bucks yeah. and blah, blah, blah. And it's it's garbage anyway. But then like, because we were franchising our, our one of our other companies, it's insane. And and I'm telling you the empowerment that these people have. It, it's uh, the only one I've, I've actually kind of, I had a good friend and he was at Costco. Yeah, Costco was a good one too. He was he was head over heels for Costco, brother. He was just well, he and I'm like he's got the red vest and he's at the cashier stand. I'm like, be you good? And he he was just a pig and shit. Yeah. He was so happy and I'm like, how are you, Costco? But then like you know you do you do the guy ras thing. You go mm -hmm. listen to guy ras. And this is what Mary Kay and I, the zebra company, mm -hmm. Dan Price of uh, I don't know if you know um, Gravity. Come on, man. Yeah, cool. Um, the other person, Otterbox. You ever heard of Otterbox's yeah. story? Yeah. This motherfucker, he goes. Every, every year he's like i'll pay you a full year salary to leave if this is not what you thought it would be and they're like no i'd never leave i love it yeah that's come on come on did we over promise and under no i'm an otter like otter box of all places yep. yeah yeah he's worth a couple billion dollars I, cool. I, I, and i would chick fil like if, if ever if kennedy central makes i need to hire customer service people i'm going chick-fil-a i'm telling you man. i'm going i'm going chick-fil-a and starbucks i'm telling those you. two places what are you doing you working part-time colleges full-time gig you know but 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 gravity payments had the same thing for a, a, an age for a um customer success so a customer support person they put up a customer support job 870 people apply yeah i saw that yeah. 872 fucking people come on you're doing something right for customer service to get 872 applications that's cool that's cool and that's a business that's sustainable even do downturns through oh yeah those are those ones and like if you want to talk about startup I was lucky enough to work with the company and, and we had a team, only about 11 of us. Um, when our, our founder, he, uh, he, he just wasn't running it right. And we were going to miss payroll and, and all 11 were like, it's cool. Yeah. Get us next time. I know the same thing happened with Grab Damn Price and COVID first hit. All of the employees, I think like 95% of them took a, took a volunteer, took a pay cut. They didn't, they, they, he didn't have to ask. He just, they just came to him, hey, we're taking out, you know, we need to cut this money out. You know, Come on. You know. Come on. And you know, he made them whole 10 times over. Oh, yeah. After. Oh, yeah. It's not fucking complicated, Jay. No. It's not. You know it's not. So that's why, like, all this bull. And I think what happened when I came up here, uh, I still had that old school mentality. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's hard. And I've had to force it here. I'll be really honest. I've had to force it. I'm lucky again. I, I keep pontificating about her. Uh, sorry to the wife. Um, Mary Kay, she, 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 she's good people, man. She doesn't budge. She, she, she knows who she is, and she knows who she doesn't care about. Yeah, I would say like, you no, know, no, people are your best resource, take your people, however, comma, some people do suck. Yeah. I think the problem is a lot of people, bosses, they took too long to get rid of those people that suck, right? And my thing is like, if you came to mind to fire someone, everyone in the company already knows they should be gone, right? And so they see the people getting away with bullshit, they're not doing right, and they you know, tend to do the same thing, right? So yeah. I, I don't, I mean, I, I actually, actually, I probably shouldn't say this out loud. Like, I do respect him. I, I watch most issues. Uh, Gary V, mm. fire fast, yeah. just fire fast. He already knows. Don't make it three years. Don't make it. Yeah, three and months. he's talking about in his pocket about how he made mistakes before, trying to be empathetic. You know, what do you need? Can I help you out? And just everyone sees it like this person brings no value, right? And everyone sees this of you, Gary. Yeah. yeah. And, and and now, but it, but it's hard, right? No one wants to be the bad person, right? And there's always like, 
oh, it's his birthday, Christmas coming up. There's always going to be some. the baseball game, whatever, yeah, yeah. you know. His you know. pinky hurts. Yeah. It's, oh, it's 65 degrees today, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's raining. We can't, we can't fire him today. Yeah, but no, it's, that's why you're paid to be a boss, right? Yeah, man. And that's why you have the big X on your back. And I, I don't, I, I, I've been lucky enough to see so many different styles of leadership and, and, and pill, pull the best and, and, and understand the worst, to be honest. And I, I, I think it's a really interesting paradigm. But what fucks, what's fucked up now is we want to talk about leadership. Where are we all trying to get our leadership from? And we're, we're not seeing it. Our, what, whatever leadership is going on right now is just kind of a rounding error. And I, I'm, again, I'm not talking politics or anything like that. Just in general, like we're a dumpster fire. So we if are. that's something where you're like questioning, like, well, that's supposed to be this pseudo leadership. Who am I then to start my own type of leadership? So I think it's getting people very agnostic and getting people to do whatever they think they can to make it work, which I respect. I have to understand that model. Um, if you, you know, in Texas, all places doing it the wrong way, but if, if you shut down, I understand the greater good, but if you shut down somebody's business, oh, sorry, shut down somebody's business for a, a period of time due to X, Y, and Z, you should have a fucking consi- you know, constituency or a, a, a plan. You need to have a plan in place. You have to have a plan in place, a contingency plan in place for when you shut people down. You don't just say, hey, I'm going to shut you down. I'm going I'm to figure it out and you're yeah. going to figure it out. I mean, I heard some crazy shit. I heard some crazy, and I'm sure you had too, but, you know, people, just people kind of really getting the short end of the stick. And I, and I can, so I can understand the frustration. I really, really can. I can't agree to it and I can't condone it, but I can understand. It. So two things, first thing, just a comment. So I don't like to talk, 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 talk about policy. No, that's fine. No, but one thing is like, you know, we, as a country, we have to do better. Instead of 2024, it's going to be Biden-Trump again. Like, as a country, come on, man. Like, we have to do fucking better it's gonna be painful. than Biden-Trump. Like, it's gonna are, be are, are you kidding me? Right? Before there was Trump-Hillary Clinton. Like, we have to do better. There has to be someone out there we don't know about. It's gonna like, be some kind of, like, you know, JFK, Ronald Reagan type, you know, charismatic leader who, like, is hopefully under 60 years old, right? It's gonna be we, we can't have Biden-Trump again. I it's mean, gonna it, 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 cannot, it cannot happen, right? In, in like, but I'm from te- like, I'm a Texan. I'm like a quintessential, like quintessential, quintessential. Like I'm a Texan before I'm an American. Don't say that in public. I'm the same way. I'm same a Texan way. before Texan, I'm an American. Texan for I'm American, sorry. Yeah. I am. I'm still like, what the fuck are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? And you, you, you're my people. You're my people. But what the fuck are we doing? So it's hard. It's really, really hard. And, and I own guns. I, I mean, that's me as a person and hard. It's really hard. Man. It's really hard. And I'm a, middle easterner like that doesn't help either <laughs> you know, let's, let's be really real it's um as you know uh we uh my, my my wife she's asian and uh we got my son and i were in a car uh sorry Seth, if you don't know this uh we got pulled up we got cut off by somebody and they got out and were yelling at my son and yeah kid's fucking six mm. he's six just because he's asian I'm like really you don't know me man let's just like get in your car but then he started talking about um, what car I was driving versus what car he was driving and how he's just the work. I was like, so I hear all this, just this vitriol and just a spouse from his mouth. And, and it was just the most arbitrary, random shit. I'm mm-hmm. like, hey, man, you OK? Like, it was not about me. It was yeah. Son. It wasn't. Just something else going on. So we sat down on a curb for 30 minutes and just talked. Yeah. He was like, man, I'm not. I was like, OK, dude. We still text now. Like, I get it. I get it. I get it. And I think, unfortunately for me, I mean, I go from zero to 100 real quick, and I try not to. Um, I think we're all just in that space right now. I've never seen it more bi- bipolar, to yeah. be honest, to be straight up honest. I've never seen it more bipolar. I don't know what your experience was, but back home, shit, man, I had the most ghetto ass dudes and the most country ass dudes, and we were thick. Yeah. We were thick. Yeah. We were thick. Exactly. We were so thick. Like, what, what? It's been a transition. It's, it's crazy times, right? It is. And you know, back home, as I'm sure you know, like if we don't like you, we're gonna stab you in the face. Mm-hmm. Here it's or like in places now, so like, oh, behind your back. Like, no, yeah. just tell me. Just tell yeah. me. It's okay. It's okay. We'll be better off just understanding who we are and where it comes from. I think there's so much going on. I mean, with these exigent circumstances that are so reactive, it's like, where is it stemming from? Like, truly, why are you so upset? What are you scared about? What's going on? Um, I watched a really, really, really interesting documentary about uh, just African-American heritage and all the pain. And it's like, and it really ended with this young lady being like, you're lucky that we don't want revenge. We just want like equality. 
And I'm like, damn, like that hit. Yeah, yeah, it hit, dude. So oh, there's a key on that one, the key to what? The city? Yeah, so with this, I guess back in the day, she came up. It was like there's like those five keys to interest or something, right? So there gives the key. It's the stories, the stories on the bottle. That's cool. Maybe a speakeasy or some shit. Yeah, yeah. So next, um, on your LinkedIn profile, you did something that says like just ship it. Talk about just shipping it. And like everyone's like, oh, my baby's not perfectly perfect, you know. Never will be, dude. Yeah. Never will be. Uh yeah. Let's break it. I have a friend. I have an amazing, amazing friend, and I haven't talked to her in maybe three or four years. And she always just told me, what are you doing, bro? What are you doing, Joe? Just throw the hat. Throw it over the fence. We'll figure out how to get it. Just act. Make action. So, you know, we're going to sit in this analysis paralysis. We'll be analytic. We're our biggest critics. We, we hate, you know, we're, we'll, we'll poke as many holes. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. Who's going to judge me? And it goes back to that whole ego thing. And it goes back to that imposter syndrome. And it goes back to just not letting others get in front of your way. And, and shipping it to me and that action and getting off that X of thought process is just the best way to do it. Because you're never going to just be perfect from day one. And so we shipped something um, and it wasn't, definitely wasn't good. It wasn't what I wanted. Didn't look optically the way and all the accoutrement could have been much better. And the actual engagement was in the 90 percentile. So we're like, okay, enough, just enough. If, if, if the content and the value is there, it doesn't matter what bow is wrapped on. So I'm a big, big, big believer in just, just, put something out there and push and iterate and push and iterate and push and iterate or else you sit, sit, sit in this analysis paralysis mm -hmm. and we all know hey cool cheesecake menu 47 pages later. oh my god yeah well, just have some fucking chicken or have some steak and see which one you like yeah that's it so we try and keep we're keep it simple so i was really lucky that I, I i got my old man my old man he's shrewd as fuck and, and he's a physician he's world renowned but he's he's a businessman at heart and he's always just like just just go, just go. So, so talk about your family background more. Cause like the, everyone's a physician. You have two master's degree, you use a medical school for a while. Like y'all, like y'all, y'all, y'all some big brain jokers in your, in your family, right? Like you're, you know, like y'all, y'all do some big things. That how was that growing up, you know, having all those role models? Like was, oh, all, that was a dumpster fire. Was almost like, Hey, you have no chance. You have no choice, better be successful. To, where, everyone where, is so successful. where do you want this to go? Where you want to go take it? So older brother, older sister, mom, and a dad. And there was another one. Um, and you, you grew up in Houston, right? Yeah. Okay. So medical center, right off the boat, though. We, we fled a war. My parents fled a war. So so what country in the Middle East are you from? Lebanon. Lebanon, okay. Yeah. So Muslim Christian war, 36 years, really bad. 3,000 mortars over my dad's head, finishing up his career in medical school, like literally under a desk. Um, came straight to Brooklyn with $432 in his but Just a quintessential immigrant bullshit story. And I love it, you know, walking through snow with lot. Yeah. Okay. Walking 10 miles with no feet. No feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you must know my dad really well, man. You must know my dad really well. So he comes in, he, he does his thing, and then and he, we, can, we can go to those stories. But uh, moved to Houston. Um, older sister was, a, was the prodigy. She, well, no, she wasn't. She was the first kid of, of, of the immigrant family. So it was basically like uh, she worked her fingers to the bone. She did everything she could. The, the Duke, you know, the brilliant, hardworking daughter. Um, valedictorian of her class. Blah, blah, blah. My brother came along and he was a savant. He's a Doogie Hauser, MD, PhD kid. Just fucking brilliant. Um, super douche, though. Like, he has no... No people skills. Wow. Hey, Kareem. His name's Kareem. Hey, Kareem, what's the hardest part of your day? Uh, you know, going throughout the day without insulting people. I'm like, dude, you can't... Like, so, so basically, your brother was Sheldon Cooper. It was so... My, oh, my God. And then some... <laughs> And then some, he was shut. Oh my God. And then some. so, and then it came to me and they're like, all right, well, you know, Raj, you two siblings are smart. Like what the fuck are you going to do? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. So, um, by the skin of my teeth, I matriculated into the school because of the last name, to be honest. I knew what I wanted to do. It wasn't, it wasn't that, but I basically had to do it to make my parents happy. Typical Middle Eastern story. Um, so at this point we're in Houston. Parents were running hospital systems. Brothers and sisters were in hospital systems. And I was here like, yeah, you know, I played college sports and like I kind of do things and stuff and it's fun. Yay. Um, because I was never the academic. And I leaned into not being the academic. And I was the, I was the, 
And they always say, who's the black sheep? I mean, I was oil. I was oil spill dark. Like, I was the worst of the worst of the worst. Because my brother and I were Irish twins. 11 months apart. And it got to the point where my mom's was, fuck this, I'm so tired. I'm just, like, so tired. I went to school in a cab. Like, that was literally what, what we did. And I kind of got lost in the wayside. And my identity didn't come through academics. It came into sports. So that was what I leaned into. And that's where I found my belonging, um, to be really honest. And not super close with anyone in our family. We, we all love each other. We respect each other. They all live here really like a block away at Swedish and, and Fred Hutch and stuff. And I just, we don't really keep up too much. We respect each other. Mm. We all have our own families, but. um, That's how, how it's fun. Like most families do it. Like, you know, they grow up close and they just, like, go different places and just friends come up. It's like, yeah, unfortunate though. I think all families are like that. And every family, like, everyone knows my families are crazy. No, you know, it's not. Isn't that hilarious? My families are crazy. No, you know, my family was crazy. Like, yeah, no, yeah. We have the same like, Uncle Ernie you do too. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, it's like like hold my beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it was. So we got to the point where it was just like, okay, who can trump who? And eh, no pun intended. And then we we we're close enough. Mm. We're close enough. It's been a. I'll be honest. We we coming off the boat, they put a lot of focus on certain things that I don't have as much of a focus on. Hey, I didn't go. I don't have a lot of student debt. So I'm privileged in that respect. I got a college scholarship, which was great. But if I didn't get one, I could have still, they would have helped. So there was definitely an opportunity cost. Um, but I'll tell you right right now, in, in, and maybe it's the, the pendulum that has one extreme and goes to the extreme. My, my pendulum is here. It might be over here. Uh, we don't, uh, my, my better hat, we don't have a nanny. We have two kids. We don't have a nanny. So we, we take our kids to school, pick them up from school. We're done at work. When it's school's done, we're, we're trying to be present. We're really, 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 and it, and it might shoot us in the foot in the in the future, but for right now, it's what we want. And how old are your kids? I think I have two at this point. Uh, six and three. Six and three, yeah. To me, six is a perfect age because they're kind of independent, you know. They really don't need you, you know. They can get dressed themselves, you know, but they still look up to you. Like it's they so still cool. admire you, right? It's so cool. What about you? Uh, my, mine are all grown. My, my oldest is like 32, 33, then 26 or 27 and 24, they're all grown, yeah. Our six-year-old, he's, brother, he's exactly that. He's getting into his own. He's having a voice. He's having a comp. Actually, our three-year-old is, too. I'm like, where the fuck you come from? Our boy, he's a, he's moving. He's shaking. He's putting his, he, exactly. He's getting a little bit more. You see his personality coming what? out. He's got some jokes. I'm like, okay, little kid, <laughs> like, shut the fuck up, all right? He's starting to smell. It's like, ah, right, he's like a, a thing. He's yeah. not just this blob of yeah. amorphousness. He's like a. He's a kid. It's cool. It's really cool. And he's, he's a good kid. So he's got his consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, where the fuck is this coming from? But <laughs> he knows it. He's getting empowerment. He's getting right and wrong. He's getting protection for others. Mm -hmm. He's, he's kind of getting the bigger picture stuff. That's good. It is. It's weird. It's really weird. But um, and then you want to nurture that. You don't know how to, you don't know yeah. how to like really lean into it. And, and you don't want to fuck it up. You don't want to derail it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to add to it. You want to have his own voice because there's no man to be a parent everyone's just figuring this shit out everyone is i'm telling out. you right now everyone's trying to figure this shit out no one's the perfect parent you know i went as far as neil degrassi as weird as this sounds like this motherfucker like super nerd people will say but like he's just a bro he was talking yeah. about his kids and he's like he got so mad at an, a family and a parent like telling the little kids uh he watched this maybe four or five year old run up to this big puddle of water and he's like oh he like you could see the excitement in his eyes like, yeah. oh Water displacement, but then the parents stopped the kid. And he's like, "No, let yeah, the kid get I, I remember seeing that. Yeah, yeah, let them get yeah. the consequences. Yeah, so you know, you want to get them the consequences safely. Yeah, but shit, dude, I get it. My my thing has always been like my, my parents got when my kids were younger, like hose on a swing, right? I put them in the swing, go higher. I put them go higher as high as they want. Now, when they fall out the swing, eventually you yeah. pick them up, wipe them off. You good? Okay, get back on the swing, right? Yeah. But you have to learn lesson long. Another thing, too, I think a lot of people get wrong, like. To me, once your kid is 13, that's them, right? There's no, if you don't, you don't have the, like the morality, integrity, what you want to call it, whatever, Interesting. whatever type of person you want by 13, because then the peer pressure takes over, yeah. the, the different outside influences that would hang out with you. To me, it's 13, right? It's always been we 13. And I think that's why we've leaned so much into these early formative years. Mm -hmm. We're just like, when you get to this autonomous zone where you're going to get, you know, armpit hair and all your little shithead friends telling you what to do, lights and shit on fire. We won't be there. Like, our thought process is done. Yeah. It's on you now. Here's one for you. Uh, and I'll tell you, tell me my answer. So, the question to you is what makes a successful parent? And this is my answer. Most people say, you know, I'm a successful parent if my kid goes to law school, doctor school, makes millions of dollars, married, does, does something like really nice. To me, my thing is like, it's pretty simple. 
if your kids are contributing to society, basically they have a job and paying taxes, you've done your job. If they're taking race aside, like they're robbing people, they're on welfare all their life, then you haven't done your job. To me, uh, my litmus test was, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, the king passes when he knows his the prince can be a king. So when I know when my son is ready to be a responsible person, more importantly, I, I think success, to be completely honest, is just to be a good person. Yeah. So empathy, understanding. I don't give a shit if he never makes a penny, if he loves what he does and he works hard. Because you work hard if you believe in what you're doing, which means he has a moral code or, or something that's driving him and passion. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I'll, I'm, I'm jaded. I'll be very honest. I'm jaded. And maybe the context will help. I didn't see my parents growing up. I just didn't. That, that was status quo. Neither did my siblings. We just didn't see them. 10 o'clock is when they came home falling asleep on the couch. Okay, cool. Why? So you can have homes in 10 different countries and never fucking step foot on them. I'm good. And I, and I, I respect them for everything they did. They didn't have parents. My parents both lost their parents in the war. Uh, my dad was three when he lost his parents. My mom was like five. Their siblings raised them. They had no idea. Um, I have so many tattoos because I start I, I started sell cut when I was 10 for a long time, for about six full years, really, really bad. And I transitioned and covered them all up with tattoos because I was more socially accepted. Mm. But I remember going hat in hand to my family, being like, hey, like this is what's going on. Nothing came from it. Not to fault them because they obviously didn't know what to do. But I think it's a really, really, really important imperative for me. And again, my pendulum might but here it needs to come back here um to me if my son can speak or if i apologize if my child daughter son can speak to what here and here mm -hmm. in a safe but true place i'll be really happy i'll be really honest that's what's going to make me happy because then we can have a conversation with them. right wrong or different they won't be alone and i was alone for way too long and it just did some some detrimental stuff to me which then was detrimental to relationships um even at 38, I'm like, 37, even at 37, I'm like, um, it's sad. I still like in my, the back of my head, subconsciously, not out loud, be like the die is cast mm -hmm. with my, my family. I don't think that's right. I don't think it has to be, but that's where I am. You make a good point. Like, like so many people out there, you know, like they grew up in like a single parent home, like on no father, right? They get married and they have sons, right? And they're like, they have no idea how to be a father, right? Cause no one saw them, right? So like, am I doing the right thing? Am I messing this up? You know? And then they, you know, maybe they do things wrong. And even then, if you do have a father, maybe your father taught you the wrong thing, way to do things, you know. Yeah. And, you know, you know, back in my day, you know, kids used to get beat the hell out, right? Yeah. You got beat. Now, shit, no one's meeting their kids no nope. more, right? It's, 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 you know, nope. it, no, that's not happening, right? So times change, different standards change too, I think, you know. It sucks, too, because, like, and again, we don't have to get into it because we don't need to, but I, I we could talk about gun control and stuff. And, and when it comes to just talking to your fucking kids. Just fucking talking to your kids and then being vulnerable yourself. There was a big, so this was actually a big thing for me. There was a huge transition with my own. So I had a big black mark on one of my companies. My old man had a big black mark on one of his companies and he got stuck in the middle of a really shitty spot and it wasn't on him, but he was stuck uh, CEO of two hospital systems. And they basically were like, they, there was an, it was a divorce. It was a divorce of hospital systems. And he was a cot on both sides. And he's like, I still don't, I don't resent him, but like he, we never talked about it. for two years. He went through and, and, I, and, and this is when I was in my, I was a grown ass man. I was in my twenties and thirties. Mm -hmm. I said, pops, like, you're not alone. I'm not your son. I mean, I know I'm your son, but I'm not a child. Yeah. He never gave me that like vulnerable. And, and I get it. Cause he never had that. So again, I, I might be doing it the wrong way and it can be from a PTSD from before, but I, I think if I can, I just find some of the pitfalls that have, have put me where I am and I'm trying just to, to mitigate them if possible. And so that's a challenge I have as a father, right? So me, my kids are all grown, daughter married, I have a grandchild, you know, kids grown, they're doing their own thing. Totally. But to me, they're always like be eight, nine, 10, right? And I know it's, I shouldn't even think that, but it's not like, and I'm like, and, and like whenever like- Cut that shit out, Jackson. And they're, and, like, and they're like so independent, right? Like so independent, right? And I always like feel left out, right? Can you tell me what's going on? Yeah. I'm good. You need some help with this? No, I'm good. And like it hurts, right? But then again, it's like then my wife said, well, "No, that says you did your job, right?" But then it's like it's just hard, right? Because you want to be like, you know, the you know the super dad come depend on me, you know. But then it's like, yeah. But did you ever go through something that you didn't want to tell your kids about? Oh yeah. And that I think that one got yeah. to me. I'm like, yeah. hey pops, like, I'm not your, I, I know I'm your kid. Mm -hmm. I'm a grown ass man. Yeah. Have some respect for me to know that I can maybe help in the situation. Yeah. It was actually really cool. I had a uh, my other mentor, so I have two two 
guys, I just lean into so much. Try this one, Nick. Yes, sir. And after you do this oh, one, we're gonna do, after you do this one, we're gonna do a have you do a review of all of them. And then done. Um, I look at him as a mentor, and 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 I was talking about I was he has an EA, and so I sent an email to his EA about some stuff, and he goes, "Hey, man, like he texted me, he goes, you don't have to send this to my EA." I was like, "Well, I mean, that's the program." I was like, "Uh." I talked to him about the relationship with my dad and how I kind of see the relationship with him. And he, he like, he stopped me in my tracks. He goes, Hey, listen, like, I, I need to talk to you about something. I was like, yeah, of course. He's like, this isn't a, like, I don't know what the fuck is. This isn't a paternal relationship. It's not. He's like, I lean, I talk to you. I get value from you, like mentor, mentee, whatever the fuck you want to think it is. This is not a paternal, like, you know, really. And it was really cool for him to say like, no, 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 no. I value the things that you're saying as well. So I think when people get that, oh, Pan Africa, that's cool. Yeah. So um, this one right here. Oh, that's a really cool one, man. Yeah. So this one is, is Italy. I'm from Italy, and this is a town oh, my family came. Yeah, that's my family came from. Colombo. So I have a yeah, yeah I have yeah. an aunt that I traced our family history back to the year 1100 to a town called yeah, so Gallo cool. something in Italy. Yeah. But what would like the MC Escher di like the diagram under this one? Yeah. So talking about Meyer Briggs, I'm an INFJ. So I Google INFJ image, and this came up. It's actually like some kind of Hindu Buddha symbol, though. That's you know, super cool. Yeah. And the yin yang stuff yeah it's great man i love all yeah. of them what about the, is that a zodiac yeah a, a sagittarius cool. yeah then um you know i'm catholic so no up downside cross for yep. saint peter saint peter blue bonnet for texas texas republic for texas. texas you know my grandson's Alamo. name right my grandson's name here suicide the come take it so this one is uh, i'm from gonzalez texas yeah and so the story is we don't know when uh the texas war for, texas war for independence started the Mexicans, Mexican government had given Texas like, a can to protect themselves. Indians, when war started, they came to get the, get the can, and, and the people in Gaza said, don't come and take it, right? Yeah. All these flags. And you see all the there's flags. One, and there was only one. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the commas, the semicolon. Uh, it's just like a, like mental health awareness, yeah, depression, yeah. stuff like that, yeah. That's the same one. Yeah. And this one, talk about Neil, um, I can't, can't even say his name right, the Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, like, you know, like everything in our body, same thing as stars. So, so this is a uh, I am star stuff. That's cool. Man. Yeah, different things like that. That might and I have like a, a grandmother's name here. Um, yeah. So I, I just then um. Here, run through it, dude. Run through it. Yeah. So here is um on one side it says um in Italian, uh, remember to live, the best you know, live your life. Yep. Another one here is it's kind of dark, but it's it's to me it's good. Like it says um if I die, I die. I mean, like, you know, I've lived my life. I've lived a great life, you know, so I've lived to, 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 all I could. I got a Johnny Cash, God's going to cut you down. Like, mom, so June, so my old lady and I, it's, uh, if I was a carpenter by June. Mm -hmm. So John, like, man, I, you know, we, we, my dad, <laughs> God bless him, man. He's just, he's just a little midget Lebanese. Dude. He's yeah. just a midget Lebanese dude with a quintessential mustache of an immigrant. You got to respect this man. And uh, he, he, he worked his fucking fingers to the bone. And I, we, he learned English with Johnny Cash. Oh, wow. So we, Nat King Cole. And, and, and like you said, you asked me, what, have I done things my kids don't know about? I'm sure your dad went through things he never told you about, you know. He did. He did. And that's life. That's life. That, that, that really whatever he, whatever life. he did, didn't do, your parents see if it's success, right? You know? Yeah. Listen, we weren't beat. We weren't, we had a shelter. We, we were so fucking privileged. It's insane. It was so he did he this man he 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 had one of 14 there's only eight left they all died in the war he fled in the middle of the night he had to fake his name he has three birthdays he came with i mean the 482 dollars in his pocket he was in brooklyn new york and they said it's 17 bucks for the night you know plus tax so it's you know 18 for you. no no fuck you fuck you you don't know you're not going to take advantage of me you said 17 you said he goes sir it's called tax he's like no no no, no. you said 17 he's like Yes, but it's called tax. Like, no, 17. I'm not, I'm no immigrant. No, 17. Okay. Okay, sir. Just, here's your seven. Yeah. I mean, you tell me immigrants start, like, people come over from the Vietnam War, you know, come from Afghanistan. I mean, the immigrant story, like, I never liked, like, to me, like, people say, no, cut down immigrants. Like, why? It brings so much, like, press perspective, it's like, the, the hunger, you know, it's the stuff that they do, people do, right? It's like, now, I, I understand being scared. Mm -hmm. That I understand because. I, I see it. I, I totally understand, you know, people coming in and, and doing things we don't want to do. I, I, I get all this fucking paradigm, but, um, you know, the reality of the situation is too, is, is people are people. Yeah. We're just human beings. They want us to do better than other people. Right. On, man, we, but we, unfortunately there's always like one out of 1000 people, like, you know, start taking advantage of you. There's not Nigerian princes out there, you know, like, so you gotta, you know, you gotta be aware. You can't be naive, you and, know? 
And like, you know what really, really got, I mean, again, I don't speak to anything, but like in Uvalde, like he, he didn't, he really didn't. No, just no, just the whole thing fucking sucks. And this is where we are. This is where the fuck we are. He does. But we could be better. Yeah. And and not to be what said, like what's getting worse. I don't think it is. I think, I think the same thing going on has always been going on, right? It's just that we know about it instantly. So what happened, I think, in our last, again, whatever you want to call it, last administration, like, it just came to, like, like the masks were taken off. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was, like, this is new. I think it's, like, oh, now we all see what's going on. So it's been, um, again, right, wrong, or indifferent. I think we're just in a very different space, and I just hope we can, you know, figure it all back out. Here's one for you. So we're talking about, you no know, business during COVID. <laughs> so this is my theory, right? So a lot of business closed down to COVID, right? My theory is like mostly like 95% of business that closed down, they would have closed down anyway, but maybe three or four or five years from now. Yeah. You know, because COVID has accelerated their failure process. Mm-hmm. I 100 percent agree. I think what also sucks too is this is this is what kind of history does. Um Katrina, when I was in New Orleans, like there was a paradigm that they wanted to shift out because they weren't, they were on their last leg, and that's what was going on. So I think COVID, COVID actually made the startups, the right startups be the right startup. Yeah, I agree. It, it did. So like in our company, we we mushroomed massively. During I COVID. mean, COVID was bad. People died. That's a very bad thing. But I know a lot of people were like, you know, like, like, for example, I mean, I know Zoom will never admit this, but yeah. for Zoom, shit, can't tell me don't say in, in the internal circles, COVID was a blessing. Yeah. No, I, I think, and I, and I think philosophically then, like, I'm not sure. It's funny. I don't think we're going to go back. I really just don't. I don't why we should. But I think it's important to understand, again, COVID, right, wrong, or indifferent, it definitely showed the true colors of what a legitimate business is. And this is kind of going back to that funding we keep talking about. You can have a great story, and stories get to certain points when times are good. When reality hits the road, and, 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 that's just, and, and again, my old man always told me, you know, find a need, fill a need. Don't make some, some fluffy bullshit. Fluffy bullshit is great, but fluffy bullshit when shit gets south, the first thing to go is your gym membership and your haircut. Yeah. So don't be a gym membership and a haircut. Like be a value add that people want. Be the pain pill, not the vitamin. And it's hard to tell people. I, uh, a perfect example, again, I was asked to invest in and be an ad board for a company, which I, I respected. I, it was more of like a frill. It was like a dating thing. And I was like, great. And I think it could make money. And But I couldn't understand the true value add. So I'm sure at this point, after two years, and especially with COVID, it's not around anymore. And two, you got to be innovative, right? Like some, I think some of the first ones our business did the same thing. Yeah. Where so many restaurants, you know, like they they deliver drinks, deliver food, yeah. you know, they stood outside, they you know did whatever they had to do. Yeah. So yeah. And that's what what I think is that's a real not pivot, but a real ability to be a company is to have adaptability and flexibility. You're not wed to one thing. You're not this. You're not this. And that's why we did so well in our company. It was like we had an idea, but when when it's funny, like I have a hypothesis in life. When I was in economics, I had a hypothesis on my economics. But when facts change, like true facts, hey, this policy has changed, this is closing, this is done, this is up, this is down. I didn't stick to some bullshit narrative that didn't adjust with the facts. Mm. But again, you go back to the false narrative, you go back to this, this imposter syndrome, the ego. And if you're built on an imposter syndrome and an ego that's more like sand, not a foundation, you can't pivot. Because your sand can't pivot, yeah. you know? So a lot of the people who are like, oh, we have this great idea for blah, 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 blah. It's more just like a story. The idea wasn't actually baked out. Yeah. I think also, and if I'm, I'm being very, very upfront, I think there's, there needs to be more people being like, no, just no. Like, not Founders Institute, but just some groups. Like, again, I have this, this, this person right here and they're, they're looking to, they're going to raise some funds and, and do this MVP. They have no idea about what the constituency, what their their target market is. They have no idea about anything. At this point, I'm like, I almost, what do I do? Like, do I actually reach out to the group that they're with? Like, you need to you need to talk to these people because they're just going to be. They're you're not setting them for, up for success, which is a hard conversation to have, yeah. but the right one to have. You don't want to kill anyone's dream or nothing like that. You know, you want to have them keep the fire, but still, you got to be realistic, right? I mean, like you do. And, and then what will kill the dream is if they raise that money and do what they want and nothing comes from it, and then just like holy shit or worse 
they try to raise money and all their investors say no and they get a bad reputation, you know? Totally. And they go raise again for the same thing. Like, no, we already said no once. Yeah. And and that's why I think um I, I think raising money is such a weird paradigm. I have I have yet to raise any money from us. Uh so my hedge fund, you know, we I raised about a, a, a 180 million, but that was just for like to get the assets in. Uh we re, no, we used 270 million for all four funds, but on the let me organically grow it. On I I like for my first startup, I didn't raise any money. My second startup haven't raised any money. And this the SaaS solution, I still haven't raised any money because I want to prove it. I really, really, really want to prove it. And then we'll only scale what we've proved. So that's the best way to do it. So Nick, do like a deep dive on mental health and healthcare reform. Uh, where do you want to start? Uh, so I'm a massive, massive proponent of mental health. Um, I was on SSRI and I still am for 17 years. I went to a therapist every week for 11 years. I went into the Menninger Clinic in Houston, Texas for 34 days, which is an inpatient mental health clinic because I had a mental health relapse. Um, I think mental health is, is, is a real, real issue. And mental health reform is as low on the totem pole as it comes, which is really frustrating, but I understand. And I'm extremely happy with Mark Cuban right now. I'm extremely happy with the medical. What, what did Mark Cuban do? So Mark Cuban did a online pharmacy, but for cost, he didn't bullshit. He did, you, it doesn't take insurance because with insurance, you have to negotiate, you know, with those providers. So Mark Cuban did an online pharmacy and I actually personally went on there to look at my SSRIs, which are the, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors for my depression and, and, and mental health. Um, and I'm really, I'm really impressed that it's being embraced on a bigger level. I think cognitive function, I, I think people don't understand that we're so, we're so, we manifest our, our mental cognitive function so much into the physical side. And, and I take the predicate approach of, of, it's a holistic approach, mental, physical, and wellness. It, it goes together, no question. So I think mental health is a massive problem right now. It's, a, it's, a, it's more of a pandemic than most people think. And mental health reform is something that is so far low on the totem pole. I hope somebody can drag it into the feed. And I, the, the problem too is it's been bastardized over the past two years with COVID because I'm not sure if you saw a lot of these guys in the, in the billions of valuation that do mental health um, telemedicine now have been just been prescribing opiates and, and stuff like that. That was bad in the army. In, just, in, in the military, like the VA, like here's some oxytoxin, here's some this, here's that, you know. And then to me, it was even worse than that. Okay, you give like you gave me like 10 pills a day to take, right? Was even worse. Like they, they said, go cold turkey. Yeah. So, like, just like that, yeah. no more pills. Like, yeah. are, are you kidding me, right? Like, it, it, and then what are they going to do? They're going to go to the black market, of course, they get are. on the street, you know. Of course, they are. Is this, this. Do you fault them? No. The fuck no. No. I fault the VA and no. I don't fault the VA. Of course, I don't fault them. I, you know, just the whole thing. And it's pretty impressive because they had a panacea in their head. Mm. For X amount of years, and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh no, that pen! Oh no, we're gonna take that back." Like, Wait, yeah. hold on, what? And things with VA, the VA gets a bad rep, but things like like I go to the VA down American Lake, nothing but great experiences, right? Yeah, the American Lake. Man. American Lake, man, to me, the top notch stories like on time. Yeah. But I heard stories from my peers at different places, like, "Oh my God, like, are you kidding me? Like, is this ridiculous? Right? Is this the same VA?" So Seattle VA, yeah, I had a guy eighteen months before he got deployed. Yeah, and he killed himself. And I'm not going to put that on them, but I'm going to put that on them. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, dude. I'm not. I don't mince months, my words. Like, 18 fucking months for one, for one psyche eval. I'm good. I'm good. So uh, yeah, but it's not lucrative. Yeah. It's not a hip replacement in the OR. It's not a this. It's not yeah. a this. And I get it. I, I, I get it. So you have to think, how does pharma get in here? How does everybody come to the table to eat together? Mm -hmm. How can we make everybody kumbaya just to help? Yeah. Just to help for the love of anything. And that's why, and when I hate it, I love philanthropic capitalism. I love the billionaires like the Mark Cubans who actually give a fuck. And it's funny, you uh, talked about um, Enron. Yeah. <laughs> My good friend, John Arnold, he, he, he sent Taurus Energy after Enron and he made 840 million bucks at Enron. But now he's fighting mental health mm -hmm. and, and pension problems and, and stuff like that. And uh, my co founder, you know, a friend of mine, he's working with him. It's like, it's a funny thing. It's like, um, almost a private the privatized fight against this public problem yeah i know like the 
I, I get so I think it's this thing called Gener Generation Z. I already get the names messed up. Yeah. Like, I don't even know what generation we're on. Yeah, Generation point. Z, like, you know, a lot of people get them grief with stuff, you know, they, you know, they eat Tide Pods, all this crazy shit. But my thing is, like, I married them for the stand they take for mental health, right? Yeah. Like, they're like, I'm taking mental health day. Yeah. Oh, you fired me, right? And, and so I admire them for that, right? They're like, upfront depression. I have this. 100%. Because my generation, you when I say you fucking depressed. Mm -mm. Get that? Are you depressed? Are you, the fuck up. What are you depressed about? Dry your eyes. You, you want to really, really, really be depressed? Yeah. You're fired. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when are you really depressed? You're fired. Dry you know? your eyes, man. No, and and, I, and again, I think that might then play into the whole modality of, of, of us not having like a nanny or a third mm -hmm. party with our kid. Because mm -hmm. I want to be like, hey, man, I know you're five going on six, or six, but like, you okay? Yeah. What's going on? Is there a problem? Use your words. And and, yeah. and people might be like, oh, he saw it. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Bitch, I have enough bullet holes and stab wounds in me right now. Like, if my son never has to deal with that, cool. Like, cool. Whatever it takes. Like, I, I think it's important for us. to, And not just my son, but like other people. Yeah. Just other people so i like it, it hit me again too because like i i know moving into seattle we work a lot downtown um it's changed and it's hard for me to accept a lot of the changes that have happened over the past I'm about how bad it is here it's hard you know i'm gonna push back on that hit me uh, so me and my friend and i meant this in the best way possible. yeah, yeah. Me, me and my family would say out here in 2009 right from my point of view downtown seattle has never been nice it's just been different degrees of wars, right? Like my aunt and uncle came to visit me 2010, took him downtown, put in a parking lot, two dudes don't fuck heroin deal, right? Mm -hmm. My aunt's like, what? You know, so to me, it was just my experience. It's never been a nice place, you know? It's always been like, like some couple years ago, walking down my place, this lady has an ax, takes it somebody's a fucking ax. Yeah. Like my, I had my nephew come visit me like some for two weeks. And he said, Uncle Jason, is this like, uh, are they feeling like walking dead here? Like what the hell's going on, right? And so when has it ever been nice? Like when has it like, you know, like, I don't think it's ever been nice. You know, it's always like protests and stuff going on. There's like, it's like, I don't, you know, I don't know. No, but, I, and I agree with you, but like, I think like back home, like in Houston, like there's a Houston food bank. There's a, like, there, they, like there are designated places to go deal with issues. Mm -hmm. And I just, I feel here. It's just, a, I mean, I was, I was with. But they spent so much money here, like billions of dollars. And it's like, yeah. worse. like where's the money? It's like, I don't get it. What is like, I mean, I'm, I could be saying this wrong, but you know, I'm sure these people like on these, like, you know, nonprofits and paid six figures, you know, but what, how do you prove you're solving the problem? Right. And, 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 and then too, like, you know, Seattle's known for like, you no, know, what's the nickname? You no know, free Seattle. Yeah. Do people come from like, you know, like Dallas, Texas to Seattle, get free services. You know, everyone's giving it to me. No, that's true or not. I have no idea. I might be making that, making that up. No, I, I mean, I don't think you are, but I, I think just in general, though, it's just like, I, I couldn't understand, I can't condone certain things and understand the policies behind them when I, when I see, you know, the most illicit illegal activities and, and two police officers just walking by because yeah. they have no authority to do it. Yeah, you can't blame them. Like, they can't chase no one. Like, what they, and, and then if they do apprehend someone, they get in trouble. They'll probably get sued. They get in trouble. And they, they hit the site. Like me, if I was a cop, I'd be looking, if I sell police, I'd be looking. So some people are like trying to get, get you know, you would. No, I get it. And then like, and you see all these monikers for like ACAB, which is like all cops are bastards. I'm mm -hmm. like, listen, I don't agree with a lot of stuff, but like all anything is the stupidest shit I've ever yeah. heard. Yeah, that's a good post you don't like to too, where it says, I'm very face like all black people aren't good, all black people ain't bad. All, you know, just, yeah. Like, like I, I, know, I, 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 I know so many good cops. Yeah, I, I know so many good cops, you know. Are you kidding me? Are you, I know some bad cops. Yeah. I know some amazing cops. I know some bad brown people i know mm. some amazing brown people i know some bad yellow people i know some yep. amazing yellow people yeah let's just call let's just calm down just calm down and it's hard too because it's not an entitlement but i think that seattle has they've been robust in a lot like i i still can't keep paying these goddamn property taxes i still yeah. can't i'm like what is going on right now yeah what are you getting for your money and then you know in texas when oil gets cut in half or real estate like everything gets cut in half yeah here it's just like no so it's the same it's so interesting so it's so interesting to understand, listen, you haven't had to have to deal with this. You haven't deal with this. Like, let's just all call a spade a spade. But I, and then I think the city's just at a, at a spot too. If, if they're trying to attack talent, uh, trying to attack talent, which I totally understand yeah. they're at a, they're at an impasse. They really, really are at an impasse. And I'm, I'm, I think startups are going to quickly realize they don't, they don't have to come up here if they don't want no. to. Yeah. And I think you, you know, can easily have your company hit Kent and come up here, you know, and like done. do networking in Seattle, you know, done. Or you can have your company in fucking Michigan versus yeah. Saskatchewan or, or, or Texas. Yeah. And which is a lot of money is going to. 
which I think is great. I really, really do. And I think these pockets of these pseudo, you know, tech hubs are moving out, which needs to happen yeah. because, you know, you see Utah, Park City, yeah. all, all these places. What's called the Silicon Hills or something? It's Silicon Utah. Slopes. It's Silicon Slopes. It's crazy. Slopes, yeah. And they're really becoming powerhouses, yeah. as they should. I mean, Sengud was there. Uh, well, I think Quato was there. Some yeah. other companies you know. And so I, I'm glad it's getting diversified. I, I think it's just more, it's imperative, not just like a diversification, but why? Yeah. It's really important to be like, hey, Silicon Valley doesn't have to be that. It just doesn't, yeah. especially if you're a bunch of snobby nosed douchebags. Yeah. Just nobody's, nobody's going to win and with that. The thing with Seattle, something that the Seattle government does is like, what do you think about like, like, like you said, the head of, we're going to pass a law where if like you're Amazon or Seattle and someone makes under $100,000, you have to pay tax for that person, right? Okay, I'll just move out of Seattle, right? Yep. And you lose all the tax revenue, yep. right? And my thing is like, you know, like you can you argue, is Amazon a good or bad company? Same with Microsoft, all these different companies, but like, the tax revenue that gives us Seattle, Seattle has to be tremendous, right? And why, why, why fuck that up? You know, I literally like we, you know, there was a young, uh, young lady who was on the city council who was just vilifying the five hundred million dollars in taxes that Amazon was paying. Like, half a billion fucking dollars, half a billion dollars funding programs, funding. This. Yeah, we can call them the atrocity of corporate, whatever. I get that. Half a billion fucking dollars. Yeah. Let's let's at least have some some conversation or something. Some reality. No, I didn't have to be conversation. Just reality check. Yeah. Like five hundred fucking million dollars in taxes. What are you doing with that money, right? Come on, who's it supporting? And what it's not Amazon's fault that you're probably wasting half of it on some bullshit. Come on, man. come on. Man. And that's what's really tough too is they're getting vilified to the point where it's like, here's the like we're not even telling you what to do with it. Yeah, we're not. And and I and I get it. I mean. Capitalism is capitalism, but if you're gonna subscribe to capitalism, then fucking subscribe to capitalism. Yeah. Just do it. Do the good and do the bad. That's how the game works. It's a game. There's gotta be a loser. If you don't want to play the game, then sit on the sideline. Please. You think about how far does Seattle have? I mean, what other city has like you know? I'm sure there's somebody you know. We have Boeing, Amazon, Microsoft, Expedia, and we could keep going on and on. Oh. Trident Seafoods. Yeah. Trident Seafoods, a billion dollar fish industry yep. at a battle, right? Yep. All the manufacturer, like, you know, it's like, I mean, like Seattle is not a bad place to be economically, right? Think about the deckhands that get hired, the tender, the gig workers that get hired. I mean, a lot of people vilify so many different things for big corporate, you know, no, just think about what they're doing. Now, I have my own issues when you say one thing and you do the exact opposite. And it's like, just don't say it. If you're going to, Hey, everything's great. Don't lay off half your constituency yeah. because you don't hit some random arbitrary metric that's based on an S10 or a 1099 or a, you know a 10K or 5K type. Yeah, but the thing with Seattle, last thing with Seattle, like they have to do better, right? Like, hey, can I take a bio break? Sorry. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if that's allowed. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Where do I go? Uh, so it's like um, I'll I'll show you. Sorry. Hey, we'll we'll be right back. So, uh, so Raj had to take a quick bathroom break, you know, so we're right back. So we're on the LinkedIn live, you know, ask any questions you have with Raj. Hopefully you, everyone's enjoying this conversation.
Hey, so we're quickly while we were on our to come back from his bathroom break. So as many of you know, I'm a, I have a startup called Kevin's HR. We do HR for companies for another few people. And right now I'm going through Founders Institute. So Founders Institute is like a free accelerator. You know, for those who know what Techstars or what Combinator is, it's like, it's like the stage before that. So we just started the program. And so this, this next week, I need to do nine customer interviews to talk, interview potential customers about the problem we're solving. So if you're listening on here and you have a, a company of 49 or fewer people, reach out to me and um, so, we, so I can set up a customer interview with you. Thanks. No worries. So Roger's back. Apologies, team. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta do it, man. All right, so that's a really good one. You've had all three, right? Yeah. So do a quick, quick review. What do you think of each one? And I'll tell you what I think and what other people think so far. I'm a Buffalo Trace kid. Yeah, you can't. You so gotta, I can't. I got to. Yeah. Buffalo Trace is a standard. Like Buffalo Trace, been on our six seventy seventy three. Joe Rogan endorses it. You know, so you know Buffalo Trace is like the to me a high standard. I gotta ask you about him then. I like the bourbon whiskey. This one. Yeah. So it's crazy. Like I think ten people have had it. Eight have liked it. No, nine have liked it. I'm the only one who doesn't like it. Really? I just I don't like it. Why? I don't know. Like to me, it's like I don't know something like I want to say too charcoaly or yeah. this. I just don't like it. Are you a bourbon kid? Or are you like like a scotch with like bourbon. Bourbon? okay? Yeah, I'm a good friend of ours. He's he just loves that really really peaty mossy. Yeah, just like the scotch. I'm like, like I like Buffalo Trace, like Bullet. You know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, a, I'm a I do just Jack. Just Jack, really, yeah. That's just kind you of, said you were raised on Jack, yeah. I sweat it out, man. I sweat it out. Yeah, everyone, everyone, everyone loves this. Like Levi, man, he he loved this. We, 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 we named Levi, dude. Yeah. So we drank this. Like we did, we did the rooftop last week. He, he loved this. So he's, we, a, he's a beautiful human. Yeah, he's, he's such nice. a good. Kid. Yeah, he's so nice. He's such a good kid. You doing okay with FI? Yeah, yeah. You liking it so far? Yeah. If so let's could... so let's review. Oh, sorry. This one. This one. I really like it. I like it too. Yeah. I really like it. I like it too. Yeah. I really like it. Yeah. But I feel like I have to like say like, oh, yeah, but I really like yeah. the blade and bow. I do too. It's not no bite either. Yeah. And I, you know, you do rocks. It's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like blade. I like that too. I like a lot. What's your favorite? Like not these, but just in general. Oh man. Um, yeah, that's a great question. A question I grew up on Crown Royal, you okay. know, so always like I talk my heart. I haven't had it for a while though, you know, I think with Crown, they have off the board, like, you know, like I like the classic crowns Yep. and then man, I, I love Crown Vanilla. They really like, but then crazy. this, but some of this crap, like crap, a crown maple. I tried it one time, like where's my fucking pancakes at, I'm right? Good. This is horrible. The Jack Daniels uh, honey. I was like, don't do that. Uh, Just crown, don't do it. Like I hate crown apple, I hate crown apple, you know. Have you tried some of the like, flavor, like the, how am I brain farting here? Screwball. So it's peanut butter whiskey. Never tried that. Ooh, it's, it's, it's sugary. And then uh, I really got into like the the Japanese whiskeys that are whiskey. Oh man, what's that one? I like. Um, oh, I can't think of it. It's, the Beaky's a really good one. Man, I can't uh, think of it. There's a Chinese. There's a Japanese whiskey I really love. I think. It's in those bamboo casks, but they still distill it the right way. Yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, bourbon like you know, so many bourbons out there, you know. But I, I, I had I, in fact, me and Ricardo Perez drank some Blattens like maybe two or three weeks ago. Which one? Oh, oh, oh man, so good, right? I had a really good type of Four Roses the other day. I was like, where the fuck did Four Roses come from? Oh, like a really good so one. a couple weeks ago, I went on bourbon. I, I bought like 10, 12 bottles of bourbon, right? So I have like bourbon everywhere. Like I have Four Roses. I don't like it. I'll give you that. I don't like Four I'll Roses. I'll give you that, dude. I don't like was Four Roses. I special one of Four Roses. I was like, where did this come from? I actually didn't But then like everyone it. said he should have Four Roses small batch. I got, the, I got the regular Four Roses. So it was just Four Roses small batch. Yeah. It's it, a game changer. Yeah. It really was. I was like, all right, I see you. I'm a I'm a Buffalo Trace kid. Yeah, I really am a Buffalo Trace kid. Like that bullet. Um, I like Basil Hayden. Oh yeah. And oh even, yeah. Even those people say it's like overpriced, you know this, but you know whatever. Basil Hayden's great. There's a. I started getting into some of the Irish whiskeys too. Um, I couldn't even get into those for some reason. What was the one that I just had? It was it was pretty good though. He uh, he did a really good job with it. But I told you that Wyoming whiskey. This and then there's a Skagit one that Mystery Mystery Distillery. Um, it's just I think it needs another year or two on it. Have you Have you tried? I'm sure you tried the wooden real wooden real whiskey. I like that. I, I the, so we did it like a few years ago and it was the wrong batch. It was, was it? a bad batch. Was it? it was really 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 early. And, uh, yeah. It was really oh. really but had a lot of bite to it. How about uh man? Uh, I think it's called High End. Yeah. The big bottles. Those yeah. Big bottles. And it's from dude. Utah, right? From Utah. Like Mormons get down like that. I didn't know that. Dude, it's so weird. There's you know you find these pockets that come out of nowhere. Yeah. 
But I think Utah is really coming into something else. Mm -hmm. I really, really think it is. They're getting a startup center. They're getting a lot of money. Um, people, from, people from California moving there, you know. Well, it's like everyone from California is moving everywhere, right? <sighs> you can have the trials. You can have the bullshit wherever you go. I, I get it. You're going to have the bullshit wherever you go. Be happy in your own skin. Yeah. I, I think for us, when we came up here, the water is really nice. I'm not going to lie. I'm a, I'm a water baby. My son's a yeah, water, I love baby. water Yeah, we get calm with that. So it's been really good. What's really sad, and I hope founders and startups know this, like know who you are as a person. I didn't realize how important it was for me to be around water. Yeah. My, my, my cognitive fruition and my, my mental clarity was totally different from my geographics. And it, I hate to say that out loud because I, I, I almost put that as a negative for myself. Yeah, water is just, to me, it's like you probably you just, just a common effect, right? Just for yourself for peace, you know, hear the waves, whatever, because you just see it, you know. But I didn't want to admit how important it was to me. Because we don't want to admit, like, hey, we have a vulnerability that this is really helping. I mean, there's a reason why I think like 75% 75 of the water is like within two miles of water, right? That's it. That's it, dude. That is really it. If you think about that, like, it kind of like lends itself to all the understanding. So I, I think... You know, we, when we came up here, it's been a, a total transition. It's been really, really good. Um, I think I had, I had a real hard problem with myself moving into, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know if, it, if you've had any failures, but moving from failure into something where you're, you're better than what you were in the past is hard. Um, we had, I had a really, really big black mark and it kind of just became who I was and it, it, it kind of marked me for a long time to the point where I just was like shit like I need to get off of that and we might all have some failures might have some startups that don't work but that you know there's no finality there really isn't how long you been in Seattle here four years four yeah. years like I, I said of Seattle a lot you know the weather the people you know kind of like kind of rude but but what we're doing like what better place to be at in Seattle right yeah no. I, I mean what better place to be at you know this the stuff going on here I mean and one thing, like people tell me, oh, the rain, like the rain is not that bad. Like I, I tell people all the time, like, <laughs> it, like if you're in Texas, it might rain in an inch in one hour, right? Yeah. Here it's gonna take a week to rain an inch, right? Yeah. The thing is always, always gray. Yeah. It's like this dome of grayness, and like. I'm okay with it because I went from like um, hot to hot and humid in, in Louisiana. Yeah, so I, I think stupid. it was like 107 in San Antonio the other day. I'm good. I have, I'll, I'll pass on that in a long way. But I mean. How's the family, like, how long has the, like, has the family been enjoying it as, like, you know, big picture stuff? Sorry about that. Yeah, my, my wife loves it here. She loves the weather, yeah. So I think, well, for us, it was more like, you know, in, in Texas, it was more, especially when we went to Houston, it was more like, you can eat and shop, mm -hmm. and that's great. And we were in the energy side, so it was conducive to our, our whatever. When I started my hedge fund, everyone was like, you got to go to New York or California. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I want to stay home. They're like, cool, you put you down on the energy side. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, okay. Um, I've just never subscribed to... You don't have to move. I don't know. I, I don't feel like you have to be beholden to anything to be who you are as a person. Yeah. I, you just don't. If you're a fucking Texan at heart and you're in Seattle, cool, be a Texan. Yep. That's okay. That's okay. That's who you are as a person. And you, you're you going to execute better as you true self than whatever. My thing's always been like, I was in the military moving around. It doesn't matter where you're, where you're at. It could be like you know the worst place in the world. You mean like Mojave Desert. You have a few good friends, some money, you know. You're good. You, you're good, right? You're good. You know. And of course, you know, the biggest thing, like, you know, we'll up in the army. Oh, it's crazy, right? Like, let's say like Fort Drum, Fort Point, no, no, no place you don't want to be, right? It's like, like middle of the woods, know where you want to be, right? And you have like, say, we'll say Fort Dex, South Carolina, the like Columbia, Capital yeah. Carolina. Right? So everyone I know that with the Fort Drum or Fort Polk, that had great bosses, they loved it, right? Yep. People in South Carolina have bad bosses, they hate it, right? So it all comes down to your boss, I think, you know? That's life. Yep. That's like that's but again, it's not just boss, it's it's a, it's belonging. It's you know, you manage them up, not out. You yep. empower them up, not out. You yep. give them responsibility. You trust but yep. verify. Yep. And I think any company that builds it that way is the best way to do it. Yeah. It really, really is. You might have some trials and tribulations, but the long game is gonna end up being there. When people feel like they belong to something, they stick to whatever that is. They 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 forego paychecks. They yeah. make sure like, hey, Jason knows what's up. He knows that well, I know that he cares about me and he loves me. Like, yeah. let me make sure that he knows that I love him back. Yeah. It's important. Like, like talking about Dan Price, you know, a, a lot of people like, you know, people like no shit on him when you just $70,000 a year or they did a little shit. But like, even just people said, hey, times are bad. I need you to work for me for free for one month. 
95% would say yes. Yes. Other five percent say we want to, but I can't do it right because it's you no. Know, this is going on. It's going on right. And I respect that. Yeah. Oh, I like. Hey, I, I respect that. Doing. And he had a five x revenue after that. Yeah. Come on, man. That's. And it, and it's not a case study. It's not anything. Yeah. It's it's just. It's only one company. You think about it. You know, like anything. It is Seattle. You know, like could it could have done the same thing in like you know, Las Vegas or Denver or you know. Nashville, Tennessee. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, but I think that's a great case study because then that comes to the leadership versus geographics. And I think that's really, really important. A lot of people move around for blah, blah, blah. And, and I think I hate to say it, like I, I continue to lean into the, the, the human, the human element to everything that comes. I mean, because Dan Price, he's pretty, per I've seen him speak. He's pretty personal. Like a few years ago, uh, I helped put him on a, a, a Seattle tech conference, right? Somewhere. Okay. He was, he was one of the guest speakers, right? Talked to everyone, took pictures, right? Very charismatic, very outgoing. Now, let's suppose Dan Price was like, you know, like, you know, Sheldon Cooper. Yeah. Would, it, would they do the same thing? I know you gave him $70,000, but you're Sheldon Cooper. I'm not, I'm not doing this for you, right? Mm -hmm. So how much is like, you know, $70,000, but how much is like his people skills, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think what's, you kind of nailed it, but that's him as a leader. Mm -hmm. I think leadership changes the whole dynamic. It really does. And, and that's a huge segue that most people don't understand that um, the mercenaries versus the missionaries, like there's going to be a lot of mercenaries in this, in these games. The reality of the situation is the mercenaries are going to be overshadowed by the missionaries because the missionaries will stick through it through three and three through thin and thin. And they see the vision. They see the stuff. And I think that a lot of startups don't understand, like you need to keep your missionaries as many as you can. And the, the mercenaries as few and far between. There's a hundred percent when you get to that point of scale, but I think in the beginning, quote unquote startup, just a bunch of missionaries, yeah, I'm which a, is hard. That reminds me of like, like a few years ago, I was doing to go to like a lot of networking events, right? Net, you know, startup stuff. And I was talking to, she did customer service at the Gravity and we're yeah. talking like, it was right, right after the 7,000. And she's told me, Jason, I'll be honest with you, even before the pay raise, I would never quit Gravity. See, like, like she said, even before 70,000, I would never quit Gravity. Just like, he, you know, we, we know his heart. He takes care of us like this. Yeah. I, I had a I had a post actually on LinkedIn about ClickUp, and it was it was it was very very apropos and very frustrating because everybody got this email on Customer Appreciation Day, and the Customer Appreciation Day email said, "Hey Nathan, thank you so much." For, and I was like, and like this was I'm not gonna lie, Jay. This was like I was having a personal day. It was a personal day of just low anger, and I was like. I'm just like, not fucking Nathan. My name isn't fucking Nathan. It's Raja. I'm a brown, you know, Middle Easterner. Please listen to me. And I wrote that and I posted it. And ClickUp responded. Zeb Effens, which is the founder of mm -hmm. ClickUp, responded. So basically caught you the wrong moment. But every single one of them was like, hey, we are so sorry. We're so sorry. We fucked up. But they came to me personally. Yeah. And they did it intimately. And over the past two years, like I've seen them operate and I'm wholeheartedly a fan mm. unequivocally. And I said, Hey, I made a post. You guys responded. I 100% know it was an algorithmic fuck up. I love you. Thank you for saying like, it was the smallest thing to me, but they all were like, mm. and, and, and whatever, if, if this helps, like I had 25,000 comments on that. Is my biggest post yet. Not like I cared, but it was like, hey, click up. You fucked up. Yeah. And it got to me today. And they immediately came in. Most hey, companies don't do that. They don't. Billions dollar companies don't do that. They don't do that. And they all like responded to me directly. I was like, do you get it, people? Like, this is how it works. Yeah. Even at the smallest microcosm of a level, it's a huge, huge, huge factor. And it's it, that escapes a lot of people right now. And I, I, I hope it comes back full circle. Probably won't, but I hope it does. So change subjects. Talk about the importance of data. Oh, I'm a I'm a data slut. I'm not. <laughs> I'm a data slut. I just I just am. I, I think it's so interesting. Um, you attribution and all like stuff. I think data is, it's boring and minutia, but it's so important. It's so important when you start understanding the flywheel and the scalability and and where it all comes from and and, and attributions and and data analytics and you don't have to be a data scientist at heart, but you have to understand, hey, this is working. This isn't working. We need to throw a little bit more behind this one. We need to put this one on the side. 
Um, it's again, it's it's a little bit more granular and minutia, not as as sexy, but it's really, really, really important that most people understand that data is the most important thing that we have right now. And you can monetize data. You can you can you can you can you do whatever you want with that in a, in a nefarious way or in a good way. And I think that people who do it in the good way will continue to have repeat business. And I think that people who do it in a nefarious way will be like, eh, we have to finish out these few dollars that we can get. And it's been happening right now. So talk about this. Like, I think a lot of people, they get data confused, right? A lot of people are like, you know, here's a thousand rooms of data and they throw it at you, right? Which is fucking useless, right? Yep. How do you go from like a straight data to like learning the story behind the data? Mm -hmm. Like what's the saying? Like, you know, is uh, like, so you said, I say 20%, right? Well, 20% could be two out of 10 or could be like two million out of you know, whatever million, right? Yeah. You have to, yeah, that's really hard. You have to, Again, I'll go back to knowing what a win is to most people when it comes to data. For me, data, 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 whatever you want to call it, I think it's more talking about the user. And I have my idea about what I want. And the data is the actual attribution to what I want versus what the uptake is. And I think people don't understand that bridge and that chasm is massive. And data is the only thing that bridges the chasm between what you think your hypothesis and your scientific method and what your constituents you actually want. So here's what I think of X, Y, and Z and has 0% efficacy with my, with, my, with my end user. This data is telling me, hey, this bridge is wrong. And I think data is the one, it's, it's really sad. It's the equalizer. Mm -hmm. It's my baby's so cute. Well, the data says it's not. Nobody's, yeah. Nobody gives a shit. And I'm like, but I want my baby to be cute. Yeah, no, 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 no. We want you, your baby to be cute too. It's not going to work. So, okay, my baby is funny. Okay, yeah, your baby's funny. Yeah, look, the data's saying it's funny. Now let's make a, a funny data company, you know? So I think data is, is, is one of the most important things because it's, it's unequivocally unbiased. And when you, when, you, when you take your emotions, emotions are the biggest, it's funny too. They give those four caveats, the startups of, of hey, startups don't succeed because they run out of cash and a product market fit. No, no, they do it because ego and emotions get away. I think the number one cr to crusher of, of, of startups, even if you've raised or whatever, is the emotional quotient that gets everybody yeah, a little bit. I know some of your founders who so don't ask for help. Are you kidding me? Don't ask for help. I and they know yet, they need help. I they know who to ask for. Pride is a motherfucker. Pride, I've ego is a motherfucker. Yet, I've yet to see a solo founder just fucking rock. I, because that echo chamber is brutal. The echo chamber is brutal. And, and, and it's a joke, yet it's not. But my panacea and like my, my best red team is, is my old lady because she's like, you're fucking stupid. I'm like, yes, ma'am, I am. But like, why? But why? in a good way, in a yeah. good way, like, hey, help me poke holes because she wants me to succeed in the right way. And I think, um, I think I'll be really honest, a lot of founders, myself included, because I had a little bit of success. I did. I had a little bit of success. So I project, I know that my next one's going to be I never fucking touched tech in my life. Mm -hmm. How am I going to assume that my SaaS tech is going to be better than anybody? Mm -hmm. um, but they don't want to give up. They don't want to delegate. They don't want to. Yeah. So it's like, hold on. This person isn't, isn't good enough to get equity in my company or yeah. part of my baby. Of course. Of course. And so I think the data is the one of those things that, that keeps it. It's an, it's an equalizer and a normalizer because it really is like, actually, no. You know, these six months of traction that you thought on your sprint didn't really work. Do you want to listen to what we're saying and then move the next iteration, or do you want to continue with this head bashing against the wall? I think most founders have also messed up in like, you know, like you always see, like, you know, you're a founder, you don't bring co founders, right? And let's say you're like, you know, extrovert and, and technical, operational. So you're bringing two other white guys, operational, technical. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me, right? You yep. know, like me, like, I, I know, like, I'm an introvert, introvert. I have no creative TV at all. So, I like to bring in creative people who like to talk too much, right? Yeah, that's good but, balance to me. But you were just honest with yourself. That's the real, like, that's yeah. the only catalyst that gets you there. Yeah. And this is, so Mary Kay, he like, it, she says it in jest, my business partner, we, we, we work so fucking well together because um, she calls me Tony Stark and she's Pepper Potts. Because <laughs> I'm off the fucking rails. Yeah. She keeps the processes in place and yeah. she, keeps, she keeps it going forward. And ideas are great if you can't execute them. But you know, like you say, you got to be authentic to yourself sometimes. Like you're true to yourself, right? You know, like what's the best? And I think people too, like they mess up when they become a startup founder. Like what's the best for me? No, what's the best for your company? What's yeah. going to move your company for, right? Yeah. 
and I had a guy, I had a kid and, and I see him just pontificating and all over the place and posting and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just shut the fuck up, man. Just shut up. Just shut up. You're, you, you, I know you you want to raise. And that's, I think for me, it's really hard to buy into it then because it's, um, it's just a lot of just frenetic bullshit. It's like, Hey, this is what's going on. And so we're this and this and like, no, no, it's a great idea. It's working mm-hmm. for a little bit. Stop talking, continue to validate. It's too early in this. And that's why I think I, I project some of my own inadequacies in, into what I see. It's because it's like, I know what I did. I know how it didn't work. And then I have to understand like, Hey, I see that. I see that exact same transcript going forward. How do you have that conversation? Like you said, especially on the FI, like imagine it's the FI side. It's like, Hey, Jason, I, I love what you guys are doing, but the reality situation is, and I told you, I have this exactly right now. There's somebody who's going through FI and, and they want to do, they have this idea and they want to raise. I'm like, great. But if you raise and do this, what are you going to do next? And there's yeah. no next step. There's no and if you step. raise, you know, even that person on your board, you know, you got to spend time with them. You got to manage them, you know, like, it's a bad you it's gotta a, you know like but then again you know like it's it's a what's a like chicken eat egg thing right you know it's like and i think a lot of people have a misconception about this chicken versus the egg of hey i have to raise to do this because they've been told so many different ways that's the only way to do it and, just, and especially you're not tech founder you're not tech founder you really can't build up yourself so so you got to raise the money and like you you know but then, then you might get ripped off like me you know, we're talking about this later, but I, I've been to so many tech people, right? It's just yep. going to challenge, right? Some people have stolen money from me. Some yep. people have flaked on me. I got a great person now, my co-founder, but it's like, if you're not a tech founder, like, do you like, do you outsource? Like, uh, it's like, it's like. So I'm going to have to do a shameless plug here. Okay. If that's allowed. Yes. My shameless plug. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a shameless plug here. My shameless plug is for the Zig. So I met a, a gentleman, Christopher Chileshe. Through an acquaintance, he's a Microsoft, Goldman, you know, brilliant human being. And I begged this guy to help me. I said, hey, I want an app. Here's, here's this SRW, here's your scope. Let's go. He goes, yeah, great. No. Hey, I, I talked to my friend. He said, you're like one of the best developer groups that we have. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. No. Here's money. I have an idea. Please take it. No. What the fuck dude he wouldn't that's so rare he wouldn't do it some people just take your money and then fuck it up he wouldn't do it he continued to push back i was like hey man like listen chris i have an idea i'd really like you to build this mvp for me here are the funds he's like yeah no this is great go find somebody else i was like so many people take people just take your money have no idea what they're doing said, okay like did i insult you he's like no 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 he's like what are you doing here i was like what are you talking about i was like what are you doing here? It's like, I don't know. I was like, yeah, you're linking them to, you know, a different native environment, which is leakage. Who cares? It's like they're leaving your platform. It's like, okay. He's like, and that's tech debt. So you're going to support tech debt. That's not even on your native platform for somebody else's platform. I was like, huh? What? Like you're saying all these words I don't get. He's like, no, I, I know you don't. He's like, your, your app is great. I love it. Uh, it'll be mothballed on a shelf. If I do it, I was like, <clears throat> Fuck you, but what? And he's like, no, no, no. Think about this. 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 And I was like, I re-engineered the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I re-engineered the whole thing. And then he finally was like, okay, let's crawl, and then we'll walk, and then we'll run. I haven't left him since. Nice. I haven't left him since. So talk about this. So you're you're, you're non-tech, right? So I talk about some podcasts a lot, right? So let's suppose how how do you deal with this, right? So let's suppose this is a good one because it was let me awesome. Go. Let's be going. So let's suppose you ask John Bob. John Bob, go open the door. John Bob gets up, open the door. You ask John Bob, the tech guy. You got to tell John Bob, the tech guy, stand up at 20 degree angle, use 10% thrust. Is that bit detailed, 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 right? How do you work through that? You know, like, because in your mind, you have to understand this, right? How do you not get this, right? But like, you can't only say one through 10, you got to say 1A, 1B, 1C. And it's like, you got to break down the nest ass. And like, as a founder, like, you ain't got time for that crap. But then you have to make time, right? And how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you personally deal with that? With you and your tech people? I'll be really honest. I lucked out. My tech people know what to do. 
I, you're I, so fucking lucky. I no, I am so hey, I'm so lucky. I went through I went through Top Tall. I went through 47. Top Tall was like one of the best of best, right? I went through 47 of those motherfuckers. And every single one, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. And when they said, yeah, I can do it, I was like, the first person I talked to who is a referral from a friend said, there's no way I can do this. Mm -hmm. So I, I immediately had my, my, my litmus test. So many tech people, their first reaction is, I can do it. Can you really? Brother, he, he, he was, I was so, I was, I was mad at him. I was mad at him. I was like, hey, man, hey, man, woman, whatever. Hey, person, the fuck? Here's my money. It's good money. Like, take it. Like, you get my idea. He's like, yeah, that's great. Nope. He didn't want to put his name on something he knew wouldn't work. That's, that's pride. That's understanding. That's like, that's, it was really, really cool. And, and now it's not, a, it's not, it's, it's not funny that I'm like, he has three other amazing groups going forward. And I'm like over here trying to invest in his company. Who won't take it. He's, <laughs> he's a, he's a brilliant human being who does right by people in the right way. It delivers an amazing product. And I, I really, really lucked out. But I lucked out in the fact that I didn't really, I, I had no understanding of what I was doing. I had no understanding of consequences. I had no understanding of anything. I was like, hey, I'm just going to try this out. And he was like, yeah, great. And I, I was lucky enough that hey, I- Hey, watch, move, move to some. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was lucky enough that I fell into a group that just just wanted to make good products. Um, you play college football, right? Yeah. Talk about the experience. Like, what, what you know, like all that kind of stuff. Oh man. Good experience, bad experience. Best experience of my life, to be really, really honest. Um, and I think that's where I kind of got my 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 personality of, of team and, and so uh they call me speed bump. I was the speed bump. I was I played division one college football, and at that point, being five nothing, a hundred and nothing pounds, you're a speed bump. What, what position you play? I play DB in special teams. Okay, and 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 I was. Lucky. I mean, it's it crazy. Like like you're a pretty big ass motherfucking dude, right? No, I was a uh, fucking round. I mean, like like you're like you're like you're a pretty fucking big fucking oh, dude, yeah, like to me. Like, so so if you're like the if you're like the shrimp, or like goddamn, how big these other jokers are? I love you. I was thirty two pounds heavier when I played. I was thirty two pounds heavier, and I was angry, and I fucking had didn't care about my body and i was playing with you know seven foot four and bound black guys who could go coast to coast in seven <laughs> seconds so i was like fucking shit and you you get humbled quick you find out who you are as a person and then you learn how to play smart mm -hmm. so i think i've always been the underdog and i've always succeeded in the fact that like i didn't sit in this victimhood mm -hmm. if you don't sit in victimhood and then more importantly um I, I played with no recourse. So the, the tattoos and the knuckles say ride fast. And it doesn't come from anything outside of um, the bicycle. It literally like my, my whole life is kind of the metaphor of a bicycle. When you're going like super slow and, and, and you're maybe going less than one mile an hour, that, this thing is wobbly. You're, you're like, oh, God, <clears throat> Ooh, you're barely pedaling. You're, you're about to fall over. But if you're going, if you're literally just going and you're, you're one with the bike and it's good speed, you can put your arms out. You can put your yeah. hands out. You can relax. She wants to go fast. Don't play scared in life. Don't, 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 don't do any of that. You're going to get hurt. So when ride fast is much more like just play, play 110% in life. If you get hurt, you'll get hurt at 110%, but you get hurt 10 times more at 70 or 50% because you're thinking and you're like, Oh, I'm not, uh, what? analyzing stuff you know what, what this Analysis, what that you know analysis paralysis yeah it's real it's 100 real. real yeah it is and so if you can just lean into it and just run fast it works well and so um college ball was about that i i, I was the smallest of the smallest of the small but i didn't think and i played at 115 miles but you had a scholarship hour. right yeah i i walked on and got a scholarship oh, so nice. that was so they recruited me for a bit i said cool you do this the first four weeks you got a full ride and that was because I didn't think I just played hard. I played really hard. Uh, they gave me in a fifth year. So I tacked on that masters. They paid for that. Nice. Got another one. Uh, so it, it's, you know, you leverage what you can do. You leverage what you can do and, and then you just run with it. Do you have any moment in college forward? Like, like, like you like really did something good, like made a like great tackle or like a shining moment, so to speak. <laughs> so I, I, my, my shining light and he was university of Texas. He played in the NFL. His name was Roy Williams. He's a wide receiver. 
I know him. He's from my hometown, Odessa, Texas. Yo, he's from Odessa, Texas. Yep. I laid his ass out. Indeed. I put, I took his mouth guard over here, his helmet over there. Boy, I, I, know. I laid his ass out at six foot 11 inches and I just laid him out and, and, and everyone was like, yo, you just laid out Roy Williams. Bro. I just laid out Roy Williams. Yeah. Roy Williams. Yeah. He, you know, not, not far enough. Like he does doing good things. Like, like Roy Williams, him back home in Odessa, Texas. Like he like pays for everything. Voice they club. All, he all. does so many good things, you know, like this, this great people. Like he, he, like he does, he takes a lot of care. A lot of people in Odessa, Texas. Funny enough, I'll even go one step further. Like, like uh, I'd say it was Roy Williams, but I actually have a Super Bowl wing because I was with the Saints for in 2005 when we went to Miami. Oh shit! Yeah. Oh shit! But my 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 so Jeremy Shockey, Jaron Sharper, those my my peoples, but um, Drew Brees. But my my thing was laying Roy Williams out, and he's just it. being just blindsided. When I saw his mouthpiece fly, I was like, yeah, and I just. Retired <laughs> and cleats. I'm done. That's your moment. I'm, I was it. That was it. Nobody even saw it. It was on a kickoff return. I was like, I laid his ass out, and it was like, what are you talking about? Like nothing. Don't worry about it. But I put him down. I put the the NFL Hall of Hall of Famer down. Nice, nice. And you know, nobody will ever know it but me. Yeah, and that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Yeah, yeah, all that matters. You know, and, and, and you know what? It's a great story you can tell your grandkids. That's it, man. That's it. Please. And if you can, if you can talk to yourself in the, I think that was a big thing for me too. And I, and, and sometimes I can't, I, I try and talk to myself in the mirror and I, but I'll, I'll be honest, Jay, like sometimes I look at myself and I'm like, fuck man, like who has neck tattoos? I, I'll be honest. Mm. Like sometimes I'm like, damn dude, like you're doing this, you're doing so, this. So how long you had your neck tattoos? Too long. Just stupid amounts. Just stupid shit. Like a long time ago. No, I mean, not like long, but like, but who, like for me, I personally, I had to, I had to be, I had to be real with myself. Like, man, I, I it's neck tattoos. Yeah. I, I'll be honest. Like, like, you know, I have tattoos on my ears, but I always say all this for a long time. I would say like, if you have a neck tattoo, you, you only get a neck tattoo if you're Alan Iverson and that was or it. Michael Vick or, you know, like Snoop Dogg, you no, know, like, no. it, like get a, get a neck tattoo if you have fuck you money. And that's what I, and I, and I didn't at that point. And I got there and I was just like, why am I doing this? But uh, I think it was more, it was more of a, an anger towards the, I think it was just more of an anger, uh, just a more of a fuck you to everything. Yeah. It was. And when, you know, most people know when you start at Goldman and, and on a Friday, they give you a pitch that's ready for a Monday and you sleep in the cot in the back and you're doing your DCF modeling. And these guys come in on a Monday morning and sign their name on it and just walk out. And you're just like, <sighs> just, you, you just don't want to continue to participate in ads. And, and people don't realize those, the, the people talking, you know, you make all this big money working for, you know, Wall Street, blah, blah. This is a fucking price, right? Oh my God. I mean, people don't see the price. They like one thing to like, people don't realize. If you want to be successful, make good money, you're probably not going to do it working nine to five, right? I mean, you had to sacrifice, you know, and what's that sacrifice? Like, it's like, you know, you want to work eight hours a week for Goldman Sachs, making what, what do you make and, you know, miss on your family. Yep. Everything has a price, you know? And I think that's what's really interesting is like, I, I found that at a later stage, but when I ran my own hedge fund, um, I remember, I we even talked about my brother in the Doogie Hauser of himself. Um, he, uh, you know, his graduation, I skipped his graduation because I was in the hotel on the computer trading. Mm. I drove, uh, we were all, we were all in St. Louis and I was the only one still like not understanding. Cause I was in, I was in my zone, in my head. And yeah. this dude worked four years, four years. I wasted four years of his, his accomplishments for four hours in a hotel. Yeah, have you made that right yet? Uh, no. You make that right, man. Hey, you, I you, haven't. Yeah. You do something. I don't know what it is, but you didn't make that right. Hey Jay, I think you, I think you, you hit on something. I haven't made it right yet. I haven't made a lot of things right yet. I haven't made a lot of things right yet yeah. because I also kind of fell into this paradigm of like, yeah, I know, fuck you. This is me against the world. Mm -hmm. And I haven't made a lot of things mm -hmm. right, which continues to stress relationships. Yeah. And why? I think when you get my age, you, you spend a lot of time trying to make things right, you know? And fuck that. I, I, I love you. I don't want to get to your age to start making things right. Yeah. It's not worth it. I shouldn't have made them wrong in the beginning. Yeah. I know. No, but, but this is kind of the whole point of the startup and whatnot. It's like, oh man, like, I, but, why why so you can negate and, and not pay attention and it's funny too it's like so what's the end game oh i want to have autonomy or flexibility to do what continue to not be happy so it's yeah. like it's a really interesting paradigm i mean are you are you going down that that path you want yeah so are you 
I, th- I, th- I think I am. Yeah. I think I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's one for you. Here's a different story. So there's a fisherman in like, we'll say Italy, right? Like every day who go fishing by, you know, like, you know, go fish by, you know, catch four or five fish down the market, right? So this, this capitalist came to, hey, you know, like you, you, this fish is great. You're doing a great job. How about if I give you some money, you buy more boats yeah. and, you know, do more fishing, blah, blah, blah. In 20 years, you can retire, have a great life. I have a great life now. Yeah. Like, why? I have a great life now. I, I work for a few hours, buy some fish, sell it, you know, pay my bills. I have a great life now. Why do all those fucking stress? But answer that question yourself. What makes it not? Who? Who makes it not? What idea makes it not? Do you have to have more than those fish? Does somebody say, oh, you don't have more than those fish? You're not, you're not better than me. You're not as good as me. Mm-hmm. That's why I find it so interesting. When, when, when my, my, my parents get spit on or whatever it is to the point where they're like, okay, you spit on me, but I'm going to make sure now you'll never spit on me again yeah. because I have all these things. People aren't going to spit on you because you have things or they're just going to spit on you because they just don't like you. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard. Uh, there's a perfect, and it, the exactly metaphor of a, a person who, who bought like an Island for $10,000 and, you know, somebody was like, Hey, I'll offer you 50 million for it. And he was like, why? It's like, I don't need money. Cause I'm happy on my paradise in this Island. Like, yeah. I think once we understand who we are, you have to learn to be content. And a lot what, of people can't learn to be content. Why not? I mean, as uh, far as like human nature, as far as competitiveness, like me, like, like, like me, my whole life, let's suppose I did 10 things, right? Nine things like fucking that someone said, like, suppose you're my boss, right? Yep. I did 10 things. Jason, need 10, nine things, best of the best, the greatest ever, you made so much money. The 10th thing is pretty good, but it could be better. I would destroy myself on the 10th thing. Why? Who told you, who told you that you had to do 10 out of 10 instead of nine? Out of 10? Was there anybody that, or anything that has put that in you? Myself. Okay. Myself. No, okay. That's Myself. great. I, I hate to say like that's I hate to say that's great, but like well, it's not an exigent circumstance yeah. like you're not good enough. You have to do that tenth thing. Yeah. Because a lot of people have that exigent circumstance being like, you need to do that tenth thing. Hey, you got a 98 out of a hundred. Where's the other two points? Yeah. What? How about those 98 fucking points? Yeah. No, 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 no. But if you were like, hey self-induced i want those two extra points great yeah i think it's that exigent circumstance that makes it harder i mean com- com- competitiveness competitiveness is good to a degree right yeah. it is but everything in life is going to be competitive and there's oh, and i think what sucks too is a lot of people don't understand like i i i'm the best in the world it's just not reality there's no. always somebody bigger better stronger and faster i tell people all the time like i've met a lot of people i all tell them the time no matter how hard you work, how talented you are, someone's working harder and way more talented than you. So then at what point are you happy with what you can do? Yeah. Like, and then it's like, like, you know, they tell all the time, like, you know, the, the sports commercials. I wake up at five in the morning to work out. Yeah. I wake up at three in the morning to work out. Like, I'm at 2.45 in the morning to work out. I'm at like, 2.44 in the morning. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> like, okay. It. First of all, you have some kind of life, right? Yeah. Hopefully you have some kind of social skills. You're, you meet people, you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, you know, like, yeah. you have to live your life, right? I mean, like, but most people, yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, it's, it's living the life on somebody else's dime. And to me, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Like, I don't need to wake up at three if somebody's waking up at four just to say I woke up at three because they're waking up. And that's why I love the generous Z, right? They don't give a fuck. <sighs> they do their thing, you know, like, and, 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 you know, people call them lazy and like not competitive, you know, but. I'd say the exact opposite. There are some of those kids who really, really know. So I, I totally, re- again, I, I think I've mentioned this before. Like, I totally respect the corporate lifestyle. 20 years at Boeing, 30 years at Boeing, 40 years at Boeing, Amazon. I mean, I, think about it. It's a perfect life. You know, you, you work nine to five or 20 for totally. Boeing. Nine to five, get up for five, go home, totally. eat dinner, watch TV. I totally respect that. Fucking cut the fuck off. I totally respect that. Leave work at work. Yep. I really do. Some could call that lazy. Yeah. You're right. I, I'll just be really, it's not like, you know, it's, oh, fuck. Hey. I mean, 40 hours, seven days a week has 160 hours. So you only, you only contributing, contributing to society four hours out of 60, 168. And, and so I think at some point it's like, hey, listen, at 8 p.m., I want to log on to 11 p.m. because I'm a Gen Z. If this, I'm a blah, blah, blah. blah. Mm-hmm. It's, I think it's a really interesting period. The, the corporate culture could actually be 
not lethargic, but it's like, hey, we're stuck to this paradigm of I leave work at home, yeah. which I love. I do. And I, I and I'll actually I'll push a rebuttal of um I think it's 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 really hard that this paradigm shift from societal norms to whatever is going right up now is 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 the industrial revolution, farming, like sons, daughters, whatever. They used to go with their parents. They used to go milk the cows. They used to be next to their hip. And now it's like, no, you're going to go out and do your own thing. And when that paradigm shifted, everything shifted. Now it's more like corporate culture and this and that. You have to go and do things. But I think we, we've, we've moved from the family homestead to the work homestead. And we have to embrace the repercussions of that. If we're going to idolize that and we're going to push that as a major norm moving forward, and, and which then lends itself to wealth or whatever it is, mm. it's really important to understand there's an opportunity cost. There 100% is an opportunity cost. Your kids, your family, that the family unit might be bifurcated and stressed. And if, if you want to accept one side of normality, you have to accept the other side. If you expect there's a God, you have to expect there's a devil. Yeah. Like that, I just feel like that's just normal. And right now people want to fight both sides of the stigma. Like, no, 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 you can go out and be, and you don't have to be this or this or this, but you have to stick to this. I'm like, that's two different philosophies. So we have to understand why there's a disconnect. And if you're upset about it, why you're upset about it. Yeah. And another thing too, like you're talking about, it's like, it's so, it's so complicated, right? So I, I got a brain fart. Um, let, me, let me ask you another question. You're good. So talk about Lisa, Lisa Sarah. I'm very happy. Uh, so, so you're doing a Sarah on top of your own startup, right? It's kind of together. So Lacera, again, Lacera is a prop tech company um, founded by Barrett Newberry about five years ago. Brilliant human being. So I did a direct consumer health and wellness, um, just health and wellness like platform. And it's worked really well. That was a Thrive Health. And it continues to get bigger and bigger. And what I did was I ended up doing digital health, but I'm working with apartment complexes. So we had MSAs, which was master service agreements, about 17 different apartment complexes here in Seattle alone. And they're like, listen, we love what you're doing. But I mean, Jason, I was, I was kissing babies and licking, and licking dirt. I was going to every single place. Yep. That's, that's what you have to do as a startup. I walked into a, a static book of business, which it could be apartment, apartment complexes, many of them here in, in Pioneer Square downtown. And we were just um, talking to agents and, hey, hey, this is what we're doing. And they love what we're doing. I met with Barrett and Barrett goes, you know, Raj, I love what you're doing, but you're, you're flipping over every single rock in the river. I was like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. He's like, and that's great. He's like, why don't you come to the mouth of the river? And he built out a prop tech set system that, you know, the marketplace, which is I'm one spoke in this giant hub of a wheel. You know, those old, yeah, you're a hundred spoke kid from, from Corpus Christi or in, in Texas. Mm -hmm. We did a 13 rim, hundred spoke rim. Thrive was one spoke of what he's building. So Lacer is building out a platform, a prop tech platform that's that's fighting that folio, fighting Yardy, and we're taking people right and left. And what I really appreciate about Lacer is they're um I hate God, I hate buzzwords. It's and like democratize. Yeah. It's allowing the smaller person to get in and play the game. If the big boys want to play the game and think that they're better than everybody else, we're going to show them the other way. And it's worked out really, really well. It's a prop tech company that's that's open source, open platform. It's almost like your Android. It's like your, your, your iPhone and all of your apps are on the prop tech side. So if you have any services, any maintenance requests, and you know, it's not, you don't have to pay for it. He, he has built out something that I want to be a mercenary. I mean, I want to be a missionary, not a mercenary. Yeah, I was close. I want to be a merc uh, missionary, not a mercenary. I don't want to just get paid to do well. I want to do the right thing. And this is the only um, group that I've actually found that the incentives align. And so Lacera has been kind of instrumental in me actually stopping my fundraising for my, my own company and moving towards understanding a bigger marketplace and a bigger, bigger opportunity, to be honest. So our, our health and wellness company that we built is kind of just one small cog in this giant wheel. Let's talk about this. Talk about you know, founders, you know, I like to say, if you're a founder, you, you're going to get your teeth kicked in every day, you know, nick, nick, nick down every day. Talk about the points of resiliency as a founder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think all founders need to know things are good until they're not. Things are good until they're not. The Mike Tyson rule, right? Yep. Yep. Now I had a, and, and he's Everyone's idea is great until you put it in the market. Exactly. 
and he's my Gus D'Amato. He's in, and Barrett's like, listen, he's tried and true. I think resiliency comes from not yourself. It comes from your team and not bullshit, not rah, rah, sis, boom, ba. I love you. Everything's good. It's not, it's not. If you call a spade a spade at some point, listen, we need to cut off this. We need to fire this person. This is reality. Um, resiliency is tough. Resiliency is tough because there's, there's, there's a blinding factor. I had a really, really, really good friend and I love him unconditionally. And he's like, I'm stubborn. I was like, yeah, I know Jay, you're stubborn. As he's like, yep. I've been stubborn for 14 years. It's a long time to be stubborn. Fuck that noise, dude. Fuck. I hope somebody would be like, Hey man, that's, that's 14 years of stubbornness. You need to stop. You need to stop it. And I'm very lucky that I've, I've met with some founders and some brilliant human beings that are being like, no, listen, here's resilience. Here's the, here's the litmus test and the actual end of resilience. Because resilience is great. And, and there's two adages, you know, um, companies go under when you run out of money and startups go under when you quit. Yeah. And I say all the time, you know, you only feel as an entrepreneur if you quit. That's it. And, and, and I respect that. I, I also think understanding the financial acumen of some people being like, listen, we've scaled to this. We scaled to this. I had a, I had a business, uh, a guy not too long ago, and he built some, some really, really good groups. And he built out some brick and mortar studios on the wellness side to, to a threshold of like, hey, it had a really good marketing. Hey, 10X in 10 years. And a few of them were too fast and too soon. And it was so impressive outside of resiliency for him to have hum humility, not hubris. And that's why I think it's a really interesting for resiliency, but humility and understanding. There's, they're, they're very different things. They're, yes, yes, I agree completely. I, I think resiliency and pride and hubris are very different. And he said, uh-huh, here's, it's a great marketing thing. It makes total sense. It's not working. And I said, holy shit, for him to be like, him or her, to be like, nope, it, I, I, I have 10 years worth of my push here with this great marketing campaign. It's not working. And they shut, they shut some of them down. That was the biggest litmus test to me to be like, you're resilient enough to know to shut the fuck up, to stop with whatever you said was going to work. And it didn't to re-engineer the next step and to move forward. That's true resiliency to stick through and pass your thought process and your ego. And to me, that was a really, really interesting paradigm. And I still work with that person. Rod, what's your red line? Like what would happen to happen to you? So you say, what's your red line? Say, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to stop working startups and go, get a real job. Like mine is, and actually my wife gave it to me. My real line is we can't like mortgage the house, take a sick, anything with the house, right? No money in the house. That's like, this is my real line. No. Give me my wife. What, what's your red line? Uh, my red line is more mental. My more red line is I, I wake up stressed and I go to bed stressed. My whole thing is if I go to bed, my biggest litmus test, which is my, um, I call them highlighter lines, actually, Tom Bill you. So we've been a lot of work with Tom Quest, Quest Nutrition, Tom Bill you. My highlighter line is if I go to bed thinking about it as a stressor and I wake up thinking about it as a stressor, I'm not going to do it. Okay. Because then I wake up and I look at my wife and I look at my kids and I'm like. But isn't stress part of being a part of a startup though? To something I can't control. Okay, I got it. If I, I can't it. control, like the finances are wrong, the market's wrong. Um, I haven't gone there yet, but my stressor is if I go to bed thinking about it and it's a stressor and I wake up thinking about it, it's a stressor. If there's exigent circumstance I can't control, I have to be honest about it. Okay. I do. And you were born in Lebanon, correct? Mm -hmm. How old were you when you came over here? One month. Oh, one month? Yeah, I was a puppy. So have you have you gone back there or? I, oh, I, that was my, that's home. That's, home. that's so you go, home. So you go back there a lot? All the time. I grew up. The summer's there. I have citizenship there. I did the military there. That's, that's my home. So what's something about Lebanon that like most Americans don't realize? Because most Americans, like me, my, my image on Lebanon, like yeah. the 83, you no know, bur bur bombing, you know, terrorism, all this crazy stuff, you know. So what's, what's something like me, I, I, I don't realize that's like a great thing about Lebanon. 
So people, most people don't understand. In, in September of '83, uh, the embassy was a terrible bombing. That was the day I was born. Oh wow! Oh, that was shit. the day I was born in September of '83, oh, and the shit. embassy bombing in the U.S. and it was brutal, and and everybody turned. Um, I think most people don't understand one thing about the Middle East. And you know what? Actually, I lied. I am very sorry. It's not the Middle East. It's Lebanon. My sister. So I'm Raja R A J A. My sister's Raya R A Y A. My sister, who is older than me. At two in the morning, my sister can walk down the streets of the busiest place or the most rural, no person driving mm -hmm. past place, happy and safe. She can have human beings come up to her and talk to her and make sure she's safe. They can, she can make sure that they walk her home safely. Um, there's a stigma about the Middle East about safety and 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 fem or whatever you want to call it, gender specific. But I remember one day after a big club party at two seventeen in the morning in Ashrafia, which is is the epitome of just the quintessential like oh a party. Four human four men came up to my sister who was in her forties. Mm -hmm. Said, hey, it's two seventeen in the morning. Are you safe? Do you need to walk home? And, and I implicitly trusted them to walk yeah. home. And I think that's what most people don't understand. Lebanon is a, the diaspora is about four million people, and in house about one point three. It's it's a it's a rounding air of a country, but uh, not everybody's terrible. I promise. Yeah, like like I, I spent time in the army. I spent time in Afghanistan, yeah. Kuwait, and just the greatest people. Yeah. I'm just fucking wonderful people. I mean, we're talking about Afghanistan the second time. Um, you know, so we were, so we, we, we ran like a, the Bagram Detention Facility, right? So we partnered with Afghanistan Army, right? Every, I think it was every Wednesday, they hosted a barbecue, right? Yeah. They would take a goat, slaughter like several goats, and just do this ritual. And that's not a rounding era of, of it is of, so great. And that's, that wasn't a rounding era of like, of, of stuff to them. Goats is like meat. I mean, my, my, my father, it's really sad. He's the uh, president basically the entire country's medical system. He runs LAU, which is the, the university. He was at a grocery store a week ago. It is uh, June 14th of 2022. He was at a grocery store a week ago in the Middle East, and he took the wine, not meat or anything. He took the wine. He had wine. He had one bottle of wine in his cart. He took it out, and he put it back because everybody in the store was looking at him. They're like, Oh wow, you can get wine. Oh wow, that's so impressive. He felt so bad. He didn't want to disrespect his constituency. He took the wine out of his cart. He felt so bad mm -hmm. just to get wine and he put it back. That's the reality of what's going on right now. It's not the hey, we we beat people for whatever in Lebanon. It's just like, listen, shit sucks. Shit sucks. Hyperinflation is brutal. You can't take out more than $14 in a bank every day. $14. Imagine. If I could take out fourteen dollars tops in a day, it'd be rice every month from nowhere. Are you kidding me? Right, banks would burn the fuck down. Are you kidding me? Right, a hospital system be running down like everything, but and 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 they're doing it with smiles on their faces. So you know, I remember last year. I was it was literally last year. And this is twenty nine and twenty twenty one. It was actually twenty nine. Yeah, okay, twenty twenty. So two years ago, we went back home and. We were we were on top of our uh, an apartment complex, and this man with a solid gold Rolex on, because he he's a world renowned brain surgeon, he's siphoning water out of cisterns just to get us water from our house. Come on, it's it it normalizes you. It it brings you back to reality. It brings you back to startups. It brings you back to you don't have to fire a bunch of people if you make some arbitrary like metric on a KPI. And it irks me, the coin base. It, uh, it does. I'm not, I won't mince my words. And, and this is a conversation I have with my old lady all the time. Coin base is just fucking shit, in my opinion. You know, one thing, I actually have like Bitcoin with them. I, I need to take that shit out. Just in general, like if, if, if you have this big, this idea that works and, and, and when one week, like, oh yeah, we raised blah, 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 blah. And we have the other, blah, blah, blah. And then the next week, you're like, nope, actually just fuck you. Like, where is it? Where's reality? Because it's going to have a lot of people just being like disingenuous with everything. Startups founders they're they're not gonna understand themselves i'm mean, like me, me and levi we were talking about this like last week talking about coinbase like levi said perfectly 
Like, I, I cannot support a, socio a sociopath. Well, sociopath yeah, true, true, true. So, do you know anything about the startup scene in Lebanon? Move up some. Huh? Move up some. They've uh, there's a pretty pretty vibrant startup scene there. It's really kind of know the Middle East. Like Israel gets all the pub, right? Israel like all the top nuts, you know. But holy shit! Like I actually personally didn't realize this about some of the Israeli companies. I had a, con a friend of mine talk about some of these insured tech companies in Israel. I had a I just realized one of these insured tech companies in Israel. On four, four separate occasions, have raised two hundred fifty million. That's a billion dollars. That's, a, that's insane. That's insane. Are you kidding me? So uh, there's a lot of Israeli companies that just that are doing great. Uh, I think what they're trying to realize is that these these Middle Eastern and and these third world not third world but a lot of these you know non U S countries, Pan Africa like we said. I mean, there's talent everywhere, right? There's talent everywhere. There really is talent everywhere. I mean, like you hear the story, like, you know, you know, like the random stories out of Africa, right? Some random 14 year old African kid yeah. did some, you know, like, you know, it's like, I'm making this up. Like, I have to use a bio again. I'm, <laughs> I know, I'm like a girl. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'll like, be back in like two, seven seconds. Okay. I'm so sorry, Jack. I really am. I'll be right back, brother. Oh, shit. Oh, man. Yeah, so Raj, I had to take another bathroom break. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the conversation. Um, so like I said before, uh, I'm, I'm trying to do a, well, I'm not trying, I'm doing a custom interviews for Founders Institute. So you have a company of 49 fewer people reach out to me so I can do a custom interview with you. It is, it is like fucking hilarious. Yeah, I'm just my bladder's inside. It's just one small thing. I'll finish it. One last one. You've done, you've done something really, really cool. Today. I really love the whole thing. It's nice, ain't it? It really is. What's the next? What's the next step? I uh, like for the company, the podcast. So the next step, I mean, like I'm a founder assistant right now. It's been fucking great so far. I mean, I'm a big fan of Levi. What was fucking crazy about Front Institute, like we started at 25, the same people drop off. Like I think three people already dropped out, right? Like, damn. Are we? Yeah, we're live. I don't know what. Have you, have you liked it? I've liked it. I have, I mean, like, I like Levi. We're gonna get again, it's only been for a week, right? Oh. Only been for a week, right? Okay. So like the shit hits the fan the next week. So we have a meeting tomorrow. So from June 15th to June 22nd, so it's like oh, the shit hits the fan. Like it's like this week we had we do customer interviews, customer interactions. According to like the Front Institute, like plan is like it's like, it's like 20, 20 hours, right? It's gonna last that long, probably not, right? What's the what's the what's your specific ask? Like what do you what are they sales? I, I need sales. What's speak to it? Like, okay, what? like because I, I, what's the big, like, what's the big picture? Because do you, I want to make sure that FI, that we can support you the way yeah. that you need. So me, like, I've done those sales research. I got leads. I got everything down. I don't know who to call, but I need to pick the phone up and say, hey, small business owner, will you buy my shit, you know? What's your, like, have you, have you worked on the pricing model? Like, 
Yeah, pricing everything now. Okay. And you're going to do an HR specific yeah. rollout. Yeah. Where's your niche beachhead market? Um, I know we said the under the 50. But yeah. Like, but have you, what industry, what this, what this, what this? What this? Not really. I like, like a few years ago, I did, I did construction, but construction like good old boy from the HR, you know. And everyone said they need HR, but you know, like, you know. So with me, like the, the FI last 14 weeks, to me, FI is the breaking point for me, right? Like, I either have to be a company or not coming after, after the 14 weeks, right? I'll be really honest. I'm very, very happy you got to that point because they'll be like, no or yes. Yeah. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Are you? I'm good. Well, you know, I'm good. Some people bullshit themselves. No, good on you, homie. Like, because a lot of people bullshit themselves. Like, I think it makes so much I sense. I mean, I just go work somewhere else to start up, you know? No, no, no. I mean, and yeah. Yeah. I think that's what's really, really important. I think, I mean, sometimes it's better to be number seven than number one, right? And I think a lot of people don't understand, like, so at in, in this group that I'm with, like, yeah, I'm not number one. I'm not. And that's okay. Because my company's, I'm number one, but this one, I'm learning. I'm adding. I'm, I'm validating. I'm growing. Um, what's your, what's your specific ask? Yes. Someone to say, Jason makes do sales. That's it. Jason do sales. Like for me, like it's embarrassing to say this, like no, post good. sales number one, right? Yeah. I have to say five things to do sales. Number one, I need to do sales. I do 100. I do this. I do that. Always. I was like, I know I need to do it. And like, I know I need to do it, right? I know I'm going to get kicked in. Some people say no, but yeah, that, that's, that's it. That's it. And we said, what's that one market that's like they're, they're lacking the product, like truly lacking? Um, startups, easily, startups, easily. But they don't have the money for it. Oh, can we rephrase that? Startups, no, I'm just, I'm yeah, just, I'm just wondering. I mean, so I'll play devil advocate. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you the startup story. You asked me because before we talk, how to get involved in startups. If you don't mind. Yeah. So first day is 346. You still had it before. Okay. So retired 2015, about a year before I retired. The army says, no, go on LinkedIn, find a job. So on LinkedIn, reach out to different people. It's and we know going from that to the private group. Yeah. It's, it's no fucking joke. I have so many fucking stories. I know. So I'm on LinkedIn, reach out to people, right? And this guy named Mark Monroe, shout out to Mark Monroe, big fan of his. So he's in Seattle. He sent me an email, a, a LinkedIn message. Hey, Jason, I see you on LinkedIn. Um, in the Army. I have a startup called My Unfold. We want to have college graduates and military veterans yeah. find jobs. Yeah. But no resume, because resume is going to help you out. We're going to do skills tests. Can we meet in person? I asked a question about how I'm going to find a job. Yeah, sure, no question. One question for you. What the fuck is a startup? Yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? You don't start a company. They always fucking exist. Like, you know, so he laughed with a person. He made like a quick dummies version, like MVP, lean market fit, blah, 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 whatever. Like, ball goes off. Mark, you talk about everything. Sales, marketing, you're talking about HR right now. Oh, Mark, HR, like, it's important, but way down the road. Talk some more. No, that ball goes off. Mark, you know, let me join your startup. I, you know, I can, I can learn some stuff. I can help you out, whatever. Mark, like, let me think about it. Me being me, I fucking hire myself. Yep. Start going to meetings, meeting people, blah, blah, blah. Like two years, of, two years I was there, I like to idea of things, thing, except design and code. I like to tell on this. So, interesting side fact, the person who did a design for us and marketing for us, both graduated from high school from my daughter in Korea, 2006. Hmm. So that's the fact that's the great dynamic, right? It's not saying it. Like, it's fucking cool to say, right? I, I believe in certain things. So. And uh, the great, I learned so much, I learned so much, right? Networking, meeting people, you know. But after two years, like, man, this is, Mark decided to shut it down, right? And even that day, we're talking about, man, why do we shut it down, right? We had to, we were like, we didn't have no raise money, right? But like, they shut it down, right? Like, none of these startups have, have HR. Why not? Maybe it's that idea I can do, right? Did a quick pivot from startups. I'm going to do some pro bono to small business. So I tell you to do your business validation. So small business administration says, there's five companies for another few people. Most have HR, me. I cost 50,000 more per year plus benefits. Yeah. HR consultants, 
who were like overcharged and delivered, delivered. Like, I mean, it's like a song. I work for you. You hire me. Yep. I do an audit. Hey, Rock, you need employee handbooks. Yep. I know that. We can make it for me. Oh, I don't make it for you. I just consult you. So you're going to pay me $200 an hour to tell you what you fucking know? Interesting. That's fucking bullshit, right? And then idea validation where I fucked up, you know, I tried like 331 people. And I was just like, instead of like doing the metrics and stuff, like I said before, I just like, you know, positive, Shooting negative. The head. Yeah, it's a- but like, man, no, you know, I'm happy like going like that, right? And this, you know, that's pretty much started going yeah. to that, you know, go, you know, of course, make so many mistakes, right? Like, like in my mind, Walmart right now, this is like June 2022, where I'm right now, I should have been here like June 2020. Been so many tech people, you know, like, is this made so many mistakes? Another thing, too, like, I, I saw the soft round, like, yeah, mistake I made so many times like someone will say hey here's this some kind of platform right it's a 50 percent off for six months yep i don't really need it but man can i pass this deal up nope and I, i'll pay like 20 dollars nope. a month nope and then i never fucking use it nope and when it turns to 40 you're like hey, whatever fuck i uh i literally had a, a, a i sat here with a friend i was like This actually isn't right because when I when it, we were, yeah, dude, like it's it's a it's hard. It's really 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 hard, especially going to the private side. It's it's it ends up being a really 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 hard like situation where people don't understand. They're getting fleeced. They don't want to hear it. They don't want you to tell them that. And if you do. No, you're wrong. Yeah, it's like no. Listen, uh, listen. You're not doing what you need to do for the price point that you're paying. Yeah, they don't want to hear it because then they're stupid. And and then like being a friend is so tough. Like, look, like, I've I've been to so many people right. You know, like 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 it's just crazy. Like people go through like people like to talk about that. How hard is being a founder? They don't realize like you like you tell some people to come on you come into your company right. Yeah. First of all, you might you know say tell the lie. Hey, join my startup. I'll give you one percent equity. And honestly, like if I say, hey, don't make company equity. What I'm really saying is, Raj, join my company for this pot of gold and rainbow. Hey, you're, not, you. you're not gonna fucking get it. Yep. You because like yep. if startups yep. is so like pro CEO, right? But you pro get CEO. It. But you get it. Yeah. But you well, you do more more than most, which is which is emblematic of the entire industry. Because we all feel like we're getting fleeced. We all feel like and, and again, go back to Coinbase, like, oh, yeah, everything's good. Everything's good. Everything's good. And they're like, oh, you're all gone. Yeah. Wait, what the fuck, dude? You just raised this. You're just doing this. You talk about your K1s and your, your 10 S's and your 10 Q's. And like, they're just going to do this to us. It's, it's hard. One thing I love, so many people on LinkedIn, of like on the, on the LinkedIn profile, we send an offer of Coinbase. I just fucking love that. <sighs> I fucking love that. That's hard. No, I get it. It's just such a hard paradigm to fight, man. And that's why I'm just like, when I say I build stuff, it's just like, I don't have no ego. About- it's like, how do you not know? Like, I mean, like, okay, you have to ask, like, worst case scenario, best case scenario, right? Well, some in the middle. You have to be, yo, brother. I like, I love that you just said that. Like, I'm, I'm sure we're like way past time, but like, um, there, there needs to be like in an in case of emergency break glass. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't think, and I, and again, Mary Kay was just so instrumental being like, hey, if this doesn't work, what is our like our 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 B and our C scenario? Yeah. Like founders don't think of a B and a C scenario. Good they enough. don't because they have this hubris and ego. But like the reality yeah, it has is this like, bubble. The company only matters. Shit doesn't work. And don't give a fuck about other people's feelings. Whatever. Like, the reality like, is shit doesn't work sometimes. And thing- she has an in case of oh that's what it was. She sent me. We were talking to investors, and she had an in case of emergency. The document literally said, Jay, like, in case of emergency, break glass. I'm like, I can't tell that to people. She's like, you have to. I was like, yeah. no, we have to. We have to, in case of emergency, break glass. Because it might not pan out the way that we think it will. And if you go in with that stigma of, like, it's all going to be perfect, great. It's going to be really, really difficult to, to part ties. But if you're like, hey, it's a startup. Shit sucks. Let's try and figure it out. We're in this partnership and in, in, this, in this hole together. If you can look over in the in the foxhole and they're smiling you're in good company yeah you but they have to make sure they know they got they're, they're getting in the foxhole for the right reason hey, and most people fleece them yeah so i'm, I'm gonna pull up i'm gonna pull a raj real fast right go to the bathroom bye y'all
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the camera on you. And, and what I want you to do is like this. Talk about, we didn't talk about this enough, right? Talk about how you come, like the idea for your company, what yeah, the, yeah, what the a, focus is, and what the business for your company. Cool. My man. So I appreciate it. So Thrive Health, um, what we ended up doing was we realized that a lot of people, convenience and finances are the barrier to enter. But when it comes to push come to shove, it's not about it's not about that. It's more about, hey, do we believe in ourselves? And this is habit forming. And habit forming to me was more like an empowerment movement. So we're psychosomatic, and the reality of the situation was these mental um, reps turned into physical reps. Hey, I didn't think I could do this. I didn't think I could quit my job. I didn't think I could ask for a raise. I didn't think I could break up with this person who's cheating on me. And when we realized that we can do the physical stuff, the mental stuff, uh, the psychosomatic stuff came in the second nature. So for example, I didn't think I could do this movement pattern of lunges because I didn't have enough tensile strength in the muscle. Oh my God, I did. And now that I've seen this tangible, like, like this efficacy rate, this cash value to me, which is basically me doing these, these lunges, it's more like, okay, now I've done these lunges now I know if I didn't think I could do that before and I didn't think I could ask for a raise before, now I can ask for a raise because I didn't think I'd do these lunges and I've been empowered to do these lunges. I didn't think I could do these lunges and I'm empowered to do these lunges. I didn't think I could, I could put my loved one into a you know, hospice situation with cancer because I wasn't strong enough. Well, I didn't think I was strong enough to do these lunges and I did. So once you see the physical manifestations, then the mental manifestations come to fruition. So for example, Again, we had a young lady and she goes, she, she, she came uh, from a really, really, really rough background. And it was more like uh, infidelity and then um, more of a dynamic internally with work. And she's going, I don't think I can ask for the things that I want to make myself happy. We said, well, why not? She goes, because that's just not who I am. So once we realized and, and empowered her with one of our people in the Thrive platform, that was matched personality wise. It was an empathetic Eric, not a drill sergeant Doug, saying, Hey, listen, you can figure out if you can do one movement pattern and the second movement pattern and power to do the third movement pattern. And I know it's kind of a stretch, but you can do that fourth movement pattern. The fourth movement pattern got her to that kind of turning point of, Oh, wow, this is me as a human being. I'm stronger than I think I am. I think I can do left instead of doing right. So the physical side goes with the mental side. And that's where Thrive kind of came from. And once we realized that these, these healthy habits were based more instead of, um, instead of more, more like numbers and reps, but like uh, the RQ, which is the relationship quotient, that was something that we realized was a big, 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 big deal. So we took to the relationship quotient instead of anything else. The relationship quotient is something about empowerment and belonging. Hey, I belong in this ecosystem. Hey, I, I feel empowered by this ecosystem, which is be a healthy ecosystem. And this RQ lends itself, the relationship lends itself, i.e. your Myers-Briggs lends itself to a, a sticking to this healthy habit long. And then our last iteration was kind of working towards the Tesla model. The Tesla model is more of like insurable model. And this is what we're doing actually with Thrive Health, doing it from Thrive Health as a like digital health platform to an insurance company. And the insurance capability is really important because this is something that we want to do because we, we're taking all these data analytics. And data analytics are important. Why? What does Tesla know? Tesla knows, hey, um, Jason, you drive the right speed limit. You use your blinker. You haven't gotten a wreck. You're a good driver. We're going to insure you through Tesla insurance. So what does Thrive Health know? You've been sticking to your healthy habit. You've been continuing to do that. And now on a healthy habit situation, we know for a fact that you're sticking to that. We're going to, ins we're going to insure at a lower premium versus your health insurance, kind of what that Tesla model was doing. So we've been really, really, really lucky in understanding what, what, what Thrive Health is doing and how it's been doing to, to the general constituency. Dude, I need a fucking bladder transplant. <laughs> Welcome to my life, man. Welcome to my life, man. It's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. I, I, I hope there's so many people out there that can do better for better people. And I think that uh, the general stigma is something that's, it's on a negative slope, but we can make it on a positive slope. I really think we can. So how many tattoos do you have? Two. 
too many, my man. We, I'm, I'm completely covered. Are you? Yeah. Legs too? Yeah. Yeah, I have 36. I haven't done my, I've done stuff with my ankle. It's, uh, it's been interesting though, because, you know, there's that stigma that comes from it. Yeah. And, What's been your most painful tattoo? Armpits. You got tattooing of armpits? Yeah, Dude, that you're fucking fucking insane. I literally, for no reason, on my spine and on my armpits, I got two circles and a straight, and just this, the first one's, Two circles and a, just a straight line down my spine just to be like, yeah, fuck you. The spine is pretty painful, right? Yeah. Just to enjoy it. And then on my cat, so, you know, where the bones, where there's no meat, just the bones. So I was going to do one here. I took it here and I was like, okay. Yeah. And, and then for, for me, the most painful has been this one right here. And then one of my uh, left Achilles has been the most painful. For some reason, the pits were really, really, really tough. Yeah, a really, really a lot of nerve specific, but uh, this was, but I'm sure most of yours have some meaning. Oh, yeah, all might have meaning. Yeah, so it's, we, we ended up doing some, but you know, it's been it's been hard because when you're covered in tattoos and it lends itself again to a lot of thought processes yeah. that just really aren't even real. you tell people this means something to me, right? Like, even like, like to me, the most beautiful tattoo I have, like my grandma's name, right. Even then, people are like, why you get your grandma's name tattoo, right? What's that do, right? It's again, it goes back to being binary. If you if 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 there's an issue with all these things, then you're gonna have an issue with me as a person. Yeah, which is kind of nice because it's a it's a great filter. And most people don't want to say like, oh, we want to filter out and discriminate. No, I want if like if this is an issue, which I totally under this is the wife, <laughs> which I totally understand. Like it, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So we, I know we got to end pretty quickly. Yeah. What do you what do you do for fun? shoot guns and work out and um it's lame i mentor i love talking to people at startups it's pathetic yeah. i my intellectual stimulus comes from talking to people like me i get at least one mess a day from someone either from a, a startup founder or someone looking for a job once a day I, I just love it so much right like what do you do with them I just what do you like, talk to them about? Like, where, where do you, where is your caveats? Where is your like, hey, watch out for this? Do you show them where the mind, mind fields are or you just let them figure it out? No, no, I don't let them figure out. You know, like, of course, they're going from a good place. Like, like someone's trying to find a job. I say, what's your background? You know, what are you trying to do? Who do you know? What's your social media game? You know, like, are you introvert, extrovert? All those kind of things, you know. And Star Founders, like, you know, like, Star Founders, like, it just depends what they, what they want, you know? Like, totally. Like, what do you want? Like, and what's, what's, what's crazy to me is like, it just me like, I haven't made it yet. You're like, I'm fucking struggling as fuck, right? Like, it's, it's like, part of me is like, why does this person reach out to me for advice? Well, they reach out for a reason. It's like, it was fucking crazy. Then, like, then, then, ah, that's okay, though. It's, that it's, means it, it respects it, you, Yeah, man. it's for the imposter pr syndrome, right? Yeah. Well, the imposter syndrome is... It's hard because I know when I add value, but it but it does like you know boost your ego, right? Like people reach out to you, like today someone reached out to me. Hey Jason, we met a few years ago. I'm struggling, you know. Can we meet up? I run some stuff by you. I mean, it is an ego boost, you know. I, it's an ego boost, but I think also more importantly, it's it's not a it's not imposter syndrome. If they're reaching out, they're reaching out for a reason. Yeah, brother, you got to help them. Yeah, we all we got to help each other. We all yeah. we all got to figure out where our trials and tribulations are, where our pitfalls are, and to see, and, and, and again, I like, I lean into Jeremy and Levi and, 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 and then Dave Parker and, and then Dan Kihani. I'm like, Hey guys, like I'm messing up and where yeah. am I messing up? And I've been so lucky. I've been so lucky. And that's why I think FI is so important. There's no ego. Yeah. There's like, I, when I call, when I text Levi or call Levi, Levi, he's like, that's stupid. I was like, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Levi is just so fucking great. And they're all great, man. I appreciate it all the time, man. I got to pretend to care about my family. Yeah. So, so last thing before we get out of here, I want you to spend like maybe 36 more minute, give advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about. I, it's not popular. Don't care. I, I, I know. And I'm sure you get it, but your male or female appendage is good enough i promise it's it's a really really hard time for everybody liquidity is being dried up 
don't placate and don't give platitudes. Don't compromise who you are because in the long run, you're going to end up just shooting yourself in the foot. It took us five years to get to where we wanted. And we're on a trajectory and a path that, that nobody can derail. Even market, like even market conditions can't derail it. So if you're true to who you are, if you're sticking to your experience, if you're sticking to the podcast, no exigent circumstance can derail who you are. So as cheeky and, and, and prophetic and bullshit as it sounds, stick to what you know. And then if you need to iterate, take the, a little bit of your ego out of it, but stick to who you are as a person and just be honest and have a good support system. That's not an echo chamber, but have a good support system that can make you feel vulnerable and safe at the same time. If you have a group or constituency that can make you feel vulnerable to tell you what you're thinking, Hey, I don't know if this is going to work, but safe to say it at the same time, it's better than any investor. It's better than an advisor. It's better than any network that you can have. And more importantly, they're fleeting. So lean into them. If you think it's like an online platform or whatever, if it's FI, if it's, if it's Jason and his constituency, lean into it in a big way and just really own it. Don't switch. Don't look for the next thing. A lot of people have one idea about a system and they're like, oh, this next system looks so much better because it's a system 2.0. Why? You don't need the system 2.0 if the system 1.0 has been there from thick and thin. No, you, have, you bring up a good point. One time I also learned like 20 years ago, I just recently learned none of this matters. You know, like, like don't care what people say, live your best life. We're like, just dust, dude. Yeah, we're just dust, right? You're like, we're, we're, we're here such a, such a short amount of time, we're right? Just dust, and I always sort of learned that so, so long ago, right? But it's hard. It's hard to learn. It's hard to hear. It's hard, like, wait, what are you saying over there? Like, no, no, I got to do this. No, you don't. Because everybody else wants you to do that, blah, 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 blah. It's hard. It's really, really hard. You have the tech stars and the YCs and the ups and the downs and the, and the, and the, tech in the geek wire and the crunch bases and the nfx who cares who cares because then you end up losing 40 billion dollars in, in, in a in a night I mean, and i've done it i've personally done it trust I me mean, live your best life like like uh, i'm a tiktok player too much <laughs> so like so uh, so i, I followed i, I followed different people on six all right there's one person i'm following tiktok you know like one person is like uh his name's britain Brit conti i know brooklyn right he's a photographer photographer mm -hmm. his thing is like how to spend ten dollars like different cities, right? Yeah. So ten dollars in Bangkok. Yeah. Ten dollars this, right? Why not? Just great fucking content, right? Why not? Other lady, I just recently follow. I can't remember her name. She's like 23, 24. She's a female, solo travels around the world, right? Just fucking great pictures, right? And and people are like, so are, are you are you scared? Like, no. Like, I have my, I have my she basically she's have protection. We yeah. says she has a fucking gun, I have a side phone. Like, I, I, you know, I do different stuff. I, who, you know, like, so many people do different things, right? Like, man, I'm so fucking jealous, right? Like, my, my dream is, like, go to RV, travel across the country, right? Do it. Just do it. Just, like, I, I think it's really interesting. Like, we, we get all so beholden and caught up in the bullshit. And then, like, we realize that the bullshit, even when we, when we acquire it and we get it, you still have this giant hole. Yeah. And there's the hole will always be there. You're not going to fit a hole with anything that's somebody no. else's piece. You're just not because then because that puzzle just looks weird. The puzzle looks like, oh, great. All these 999 pieces. But that one other piece of somebody else is like, nope, that doesn't fit. And think too, like, you know, you got to realize like what makes one person happy might not be enough people happy. Like I know people, a good friend of mine, his thing is baseball. Yeah. He watched baseball. He coaches yeah. baseball. He plays softball. With his kid. Yeah. He watched nine five, you know, has a decent living, you know, okay. It's their life, right? Other people like, you know, like they got to have like build, building, building down companies, right? And that's how you, that, that whole measurement of success I was talking about. It just kind of depends. Raj, man, this is a fucking good conversation. I man. love you, man. This is a lot of fun. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Love you. Do it again. Hey, Raj, thanks for your time, man. Always, brother. And story. for listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. That's really fun, dude.